Have you ever been in a bottle? A colorless bottle with a top tightly closed. You can see the flowers and the trees, but you can't smell the roses. You are not allowed. You can see the bees and the insects, but you can't feel them on your skin. They are not allowed. You can see the cars drive past, but in muffled sounds, you exist and you don't. You touch, but nothing touches you. Sometimes you want to escape this prison with open walls where I wear a tag that says, I can't get a job, a relationship, or just be happy because the bottle has rules. Am I going mad thinking the trees lie when they sway to an invisible breeze playing with my mind? These soundless birds hopping from branch to branch, acting out a silent recital of my death, which is being in a bottle with a top tightly closed. I'm not being treated humanly for the biggest crime of needing help, and therefore confined to a bottle where I see everything but never touch. Oh, that juicy job flying by, that course at the university I could do, that meal in a restaurant, all too good for one whose life is a bottle. I'm shouting, screaming for attention, tears streaming, I'm hitting the bottle walls with my fist. <sighs> but I can't hear anyone. The pain to know that outside this glass bottle there is a life a normal life. Will I ever live again? Please, somebody talk to me. Can somebody break this grass bottle for me? I need to breathe fresh air too, like every other human being. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lorraine. I really appreciate it. Um, good morning and welcome, everyone. It's nice to see some familiar faces. And for those who don't know me, my name is Alan. I'll say it in full. My name is Alan Njanji. And I'm one of the co organizers for this conference. You shortly meet my two other co-organizers, Dr. Anna Ball and Margaret Ravenscroft. We are a team from the School of Arts and Humanities here at Nottingham Kent University in the Department of English, Communications and Philosophy. And together we have developed the project that you will all be part of today, Hostile Environment, Artful Living. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Nottingham Kent University, Bonington Gallery, Noting of Refugee Week and Counterpoint Arts for facilitating this conference. I'm excited as I look forward to conversations and presentations during this conference, whose theme is indeed personal to me. Hostile environment, artful living, seeking creative approaches to sanctuary. For those who do not know, 
I am a refugee. I'm a scholar, a campaigner, and a filmmaker. Why this theme is personal is because of my journey as a refugee. I felt surrounded by hostile forces, be it language describing refugees as cockroaches, refugees being labeled as benefit chicks, or being told to go back to my country. Refugees and asylum seekers in this country have tales to tell about how they have experienced this hostility. So, my response to all this was to fight back, not in the literal sense of violence, but to have my voice heard, my story told, to reclaim my truth. It is incumbent that I do something within my craft to redress what I saw as a subjugation of refugees in the community. Having a background in filmmaking, I sought to use this medium to artfully respond to my experiences of dehumanization. I made short documentary films that highlighted the challenges that refugees face and asylums faced on a daily basis. Issues affecting our integration within communities, homelessness and destitution, xenophobia and outright hate. These films have been used as training resources, but the struggle continues because of draconian laws such as the Illegal Immigration Bill, I think it's Illegal Migration Bill, Nationalities Bill, and all sorts of, and all sorts that are being enacted into law. However, I'm not the only one fighting against these systems. So are many refugees whom you'll hear from today, who are using their talents, their experiences, and indeed their voices to speak back to the hostile environment. You'll also hear and participate in conversations from critical perspectives, the nuanced approaches that form part of intersectional solidarities and resistances in the face of unfriendly climate. The aim of today, and indeed the wider project, is to share, to embolden, and to unify our efforts as we progress to denounce systems that suppress the voices of a minority community. Through our concerted efforts, all of us in here, we are raising awareness on next steps to make the lives of refugees and asylum seekers a little better. After the introductions from my colleagues, we will proceed to have panel presentations. After the presentations, we welcome round table discussions in which we are kindly asking you to be involved, responding to questions that the panelists would have posed to you. We want our conference to be interactive. The first panel, chaired by Dr. Annabelle, will be presenting on narratives, followed by a roundtable discussion. After the roundtable discussion, we'll hear from filmmaker Riem Takri. Riem Takri, where you? We'll hear from her, uh, who will tell us about her film, Lullabies Before Sleep. We'll have an hour's lunch break with food prepared by Syrian Vegan Kitchen. Uh, big up to Manal, is she in? No, I think she's outside. <laughs> okay. Um, this is just outside uh, in the atrium, uh, as most of you have been, you know, for your drinks. Then we'll have a second panel chaired by Margaret, which will be presenting on environment, followed by a roundtable discussion. Then we'll have a 20 minute coffee break, followed by a five minute feature in which Kathleen Danmo reads poems by her grandmother, Maria Laza. After the poetry, we'll have the third and final panel I will chair, and this will be on leading the conversation. After the panel, we will have the last roundtable discussion. Following this, we have an online keynote from Professor Yenli Espiritu, 
Distinguished Professor of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, San Diego. The keynote is titled, Livability and Ungratefulness, a Refugee Critic of the Law and Humanitarianism. After the keynote, we'll have pre-gig snacks and drinks kettles of Syrian vegan kitchen. Then the comedy gig from No Direction Home is scheduled from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. You all automatically have a ticket book for this gig as part of the conference. Please stay with us if you can. I think you'll enjoy it, guaranteed. Um, there are no fire drills uh, planned today, so please leave, the fire, um, leave via the fire exits if the alarm sounds. Water is available in the atrium throughout the day. Uh, juices as well are there. Together, you need, I think most of you know where it is anyway. Um, for those who don't, you just need to go through those doors, take a right turn, another right. Uh, everything will be to your left. Um, if you need toilets, walk through those doors and make a left turn, so keep going straight, it's about 20 meters, and the toilets will be to your right. Um, thank you for joining us uh, to offer actual insights into how we can work together against the hostile environment. Thanks so much, Alan, and thank you to all of you for joining us today and for all of the work that you've sent in in advance of today, so much of which you can see on display around the gallery. Just a couple of technical notes before Margaret and I talk to you a little bit more about these key terms, hostile environment, artful living. Today's event is being filmed, uh, it's not being live streamed, but we do plan to eventually upload that filming to the Bonington Gallery YouTube channel. And you can see that there's also photography taking place, courtesy of Reem over here. If any of you do not consent to being filmed or photographed, please notify Tom at the back of the gallery here, and we'll ensure that footage is adjusted accordingly. I've also just been asked to give a brief technical notification. We're within a gallery space today with all of the kind of creativity and fluidity and possibility that that affords. But that does mean that this is not a professional conference presentation facility and you're going to see some of the tech coming in and out today. So part of today is about being artful in our living practices, being a little messy sometimes, being spontaneous, rolling with it. So please roll with us over the course of the day. But... Let's start to think a little bit more now about that term, hostile environment. One of the core aims of bringing us together here today is to hold the term hostile environment to up to the light, examining it from the many different angles that our varied perspectives across disciplines, sectors and practices afford. And I should say that in this room today, there are academics, there are activists, there are poets, there are artists, there are performers, there are people who are engaged in various forms of community activity. All of us have wonderful insights to share and we look forward to hearing your voices today. This term, hostile environment, is, after all, one that has reverberated like a siren over the course of the past decade and beyond. Infamously pronounced in 2012 by then Home Secretary Theresa May as less a policy than a governmental zeitgeist, the hostile environment, now rebranded in arguably even more Orwellian terms, the compliant environment, is at its most banal level, a series of measures aimed at excluding people currently in the UK without immigration status from basic necessities, including employment, housing, public funds, free healthcare and financial services. At a policy level, it is a denial and erosion of trust in public services, so that basic human need is deliberately unaccounted for. Over the past several years, as many of you will be aware, this deliberate denial of human need has escalated to extreme levels, present in the carceral policies of immigration detention and threat of deportation to Rwanda, the enduring policy of no recourse to public funds, and now in the illegal migration bill, which would effectively amount to an asylum ban for those who arrive here irregularly, flying in the face of international human rights law. But beyond this, it is much more than a policy. It is societal coercion and psychological abuse 
that permeates everyday spaces and everyday selves through its enforcement of popular participation within acts of everyday bordering. These not only implicate us in the control it enacts, but in the harm that it does. Whenever a landlord asks for identity documents before leasing a house, a dental receptionist asks for proof of residence, or a lecturer monitors tier four students' attendance, they, I, participate within it. If I do not, I risk harm to my own livelihood and well-being and to those monitored. Harm becomes a normalized necessity. At one level, the hostile environment is a spectacular act of home office outsourcing, but it is also a policy of divide and rule. As Charlotte Sanders writes so powerfully, hostile environment policies target the right to belonging through a racialized logic of worthy and unworthy life, which denies many migrants the resources necessary to make secure and comfortable lives in Britain. Indeed, taking aim at the bearability of life the hostile environment strategy explicitly marks particular communities for harm. This potential for harm, too, is in turn outsourced via what Mike Cole terms public pedagogies of hate and threat around the issue of immigration that is used to instill fear, stress and anxiety, not simply in those subject to immigration regulations, but also among the general public fostering suspicion, misinformation, and deliberately misplaced blame, the hostile environment is more than simply a governmentalized ghetto. It has become the society in which we all live. So, faced with this landscape, which stretches beyond the territory of immigration policy and into every facet of lived experience, it's our hope today that some of this invisibility and unbearability can be countered by looking the hostile environment straight in the eye with artful intent. Through a creative gaze, we can seek new angles of insight, not just into how the hostile environment functions top down, but how it is experienced, what it means. What does it look like? What does it feel like, smell like, taste like? Uh, sound like? How does it move? What feeds it? How is it made to feel loved? How can it be made to feel unwelcome? Over the course of the day, we'll accrue many different insights into this question, and you're asked to distill some of those onto the little postcards that you'll see given to you on your tables as you came in. We'd love you to add your thoughts onto what hostility is and what artfulness is, and please add those to our slightly shaky line of inquiry that you'll see on the wall here. Sorry, I love a good pun. Couldn't resist. Uh, but... As some starting points of provocation, here are some opening answers to some of those questions. What does the hostile environment look like? It looks like a closed door. Behind this door is a man originally from the Philippines who invites no ambulance person to attend to him during the pandemic, terrified he will be deported if he seeks medical assistance. He dies behind this door. What does the hostile environment smell like? It smells of leather and rubbery duct tape, of a small boy's terror as he watches his mother, Joy Gardner, restrained and suffocated in front of him as he struggles with those seeking to deport her to Jamaica. What does the hostile environment feel like? Like, as Lorraine has shown us, existing within a glass bottle from which you cannot break free. On a sunny Saturday in October 2021, I stood with my family on the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral in London to welcome little Amal, a 12-foot-tall puppet of a displaced Syrian girl. A spectacularly oversized nine-year-old made of cane and carbon fiber, her structure was beautiful and her exaggerated movements were eerily lifelike. We waited in anticipation alongside hundreds of other people. When Amal finally arrived, we sang, Consider Yourself, from the musical Oliver. Consider yourself at home, we told a refugee child with no such place. Consider yourself one of the family, we said, among the backdrop of the UK's hostile environment context, which Anna has just laid bare. Little Amal is the main character in an epic moving piece of public theater titled The Walk, and is an astonishing representation of artful living. 
And like some of the other lines of artfulness at vastly varying scales that we'll explore today, this production works to creatively defy the hostility faced by many seeking sanctuary. Artful intentions can indeed be supersized and hyper-visible like a mob, like the whole concept of Refugee Week and its organizers, CounterPoint Arts. CounterPoint operates itself as an artful entity at the intersection of culture, the arts, and social justice to harness the transformative power of creativity and to address issues of displacement, identity, and belonging. Their work facilitates in initiatives such as No Direction Home, the fabulous group of stand-up comedians from refugee and migrant backgrounds that will be performing at the end of today. It's a radical amplification of refugee voices that challenges dominant narratives with a belly laugh. Other examples of large-scale public-facing artful discourses in the U.S. includes programming such as Charway Sai's film projection, Hear Her Singing, on the South Bank Center in London, and the A-list celebrity-endorsed Choose Love Shop, a bricks-and-mortar store in which people can buy essential supplies and life-changing interventions for, Syri uh, for refugees and displaced people. We have seen the emergence of the Cities of Sanctuary Network um, and the University of Sanctuary Network. And then here is a brilliant um, intersectional intervention, Women for Refugee Women, whose weekly drama group performed their Set Her Free poem against immigration detention um, to an audience of 80,000 at the Women's March in 2017. And here is their ongoing politically active Rainbow Sisters program, open to lesbian, bisexual, and trans women and non-binary people seeking asylum, um, seen here celebrating in UK Black Pride. But there are further, subtler counter-narratives that we should also explore, like solidarity singing outside detention centers that cruelly and indefinitely hold those without proper documentation. There are living maps whereby newly arrived sanctuary seekers annotate maps identifying resources of use to new communities, and podcasts such as Asylum Speakers, which host conversations with asylum seekers in camps, resettling, and resettled. Literary magazine The Other Side of Hope, whose editors are here today, similarly amplifies voices through its print and digital issues, writing and edited by refugees and immigrants. And food can certainly be its own artful, socially and environmentally conscious negotiation, as we will see and taste later from Syrian Vegan Kitchen. You will notice that I haven't offered a clear definition of artful living or artful pushback, advocacy, activism, exchange. Artful living is in flux, organized and scrappy, public and personal. It is anguish and healing, anger and optimism. Over the course of the day, I encourage you to consider this. What does it mean to live artfully in the face of hostility? What is the role of art? What kinds of lived practices can be artful? During the conference and beyond, we are trying to arrive at an enhanced, creative, and critical understanding of the artful living practices that so many of us are enacting in defiance of the hostile environment faced by those seeking sanctuary. And to think about how we can extend and develop these artful responses, or as our esteemed keynote speaker, Yen Lea Spirit, who rightfully writes, these life-sustaining practices of creative uprising and innovation. So, today, as you will have already heard from Lorraine Ompanella's uh, wonderful and deeply moving reading of her poem, The Glass Bottle, copies of her book are available for sale on the table on the back of the room, by the way, alongside publications also brought by The Other Side of Hope, um, the editors of which you're going to meet and hear from a little bit later today. But we want artful interventions to permeate our day. You'll find around these walls several films from conference participants, a film over here, Voices by Anne Majanji, uh, alongside Reem Takriti's beautiful Lullabies Before Sleep, which she's going to talk to us about in a minute, and also a wonderful project by um, a connection that we have with the Hibiscus Project in London. Please do look at these works. We also have artwork created by uh, Jo McIntyre, who's going to be speaking about this project a little later on. Artwork over here by uh, Zafer Nahas, who's also in attendance. And over here, um, submissions to the Davidson Prize, uh, which Margaret led um, and to which I contributed some of, the, some of the research. So please take time to engage with this work today. Um, so, uh, we also have a number of five-minute features and performances punctuating the day, and it's in that spirit that we're now going to move into the first of our five-minute performances um, that is going to punctuate today. 
exploring what it means to live artfully against the backdrop of the hostile environment. Alan is going to introduce this performer. Our performer is Lorette Fetko, who has been a Nottingham Refugee Week partner contributor for many years now. Florette has been a National Refugee Week ambassador. She's a community organizer, setting up and running Flower Smile. Um, Flower Smile is a Nottingham-based women's group, and she's also a talented painter, poet, and performer, and has contributed to many creative projects across the city, including exhibitions at City Arts and poems in the Pamoja Anthology, published in 2018. Her style of art is highly distinctive, you will see why. And it embodies art for living in a unique sense. Self-taught, Florette describes her work as spiritual art, generated through spontaneous performances that sometimes involves music, dance, testimony, audience interaction, and costume. Often developed, performed, and photographed at home, Florette's work uses costume and pose to cross cultures and explore different kinds of identity. She works, I think, in tradition of feminist DIY performance art, complex nature of female performativity. But Florette's work, domestically situated, also emerges from an altogether more hostile environment. Creative and distinctive, from an early age, Florette was deemed to be a witch. I'm going to read that again. You need to understand this. Creative and distinctive from an early age, Florette was deemed to be a witch by her family in Cameroon and was left to live on the streets. On seeking sanctuary in the UK, Florette has found home in Nottingham's creative community. But in recent years, she too experienced hostility, experiencing violent house searches and detention by the police, who later issued apologies for mistaken identity. Here, we again hear, we are again hear echoes of Sanders' reflections on the hostile environment's creation of a racialized logic of worthy and unworthy life, which denies many migrants the resources necessary to secure and a comfortable lives in the UK. An environment that leaves home a space of precarity rather than sanctuary. Florette's response has been artful as a way to testify to this hostility. She has developed, she, she has delivered performances channeling these experiences in everyday spaces around the city, including here in Nottingham and the Victoria uh, Shopping Centre. Working beyond the institutionalised confines of artistic funding or gallery support, her art is a deep testament to the validity of everyday, self-possessed expression drawn from different cultural sources and of the potential it holds to call the host and environment to account simply by rendering human experience visible. Florette has kindly agreed to perform a version of this piece for us today, and we thank her for this artful act. Um, oh.
yourselves in whatever manner you see fit, but can I please ask the panellists for the first panel, uh, we have Tisfana and Sebastian, Naomi and Hira, if you'd like to come up and take a seat. But while we're setting up for that, please can I introduce you to Reen Takruti, who is a photographer and filmmaker, and who is going to briefly speak to us uh, for a few minutes about her film, Syrian Hello everyone. Uh, I don't prepare that before, but I will try. My name is Rim Tekriti. I'm a journalist and filmmaker from Syria. I moved to Nottingham before eight months ago uh, with my son. Uh, about my film, uh, when I had a child, when I had a child before three years ago. I used to sing a lullaby to him every day before he fell asleep. And one time I asked myself a question. When did I learn this song? Who taught to me? I didn't find an answer. This is where the idea of the film come from. During my research uh, for this film, it was interesting to note that the oldest document song in the history was a lullaby. So, a lullaby song, sung by a mother to her child. This is an important thing to know. And the highlight, the, the importance to lullaby in saving our culture, I think. I, direct, I directed lullaby before sleep during a time when most of the Syrian film documentaries or any production film about Syria was about war and damage and sick refugee and death. So for that reason, I think the first time I screened my film in Turkey, uh, the, most of the Syrian who attended start to cry and start to affected by it. And they told me, we started, we starting to forget our culture. We starting to just remember a death about Syria. So we need something to remind for, of our culture and save it. The film explore, explore, uh, explores the lullaby song by mother in both Turkey and Syrian women and capture the emotional and feeling and uh, accompany uh, these tender melodies. Uh, I mean it to document this song through a normal woman, not from the, uh, not by export or historian, historians or musical, because my mother and my grandmother and maybe your mother, your grandmother, maybe your father also, <laughs> Uh, uh, save this lullaby, not about historian maybe. So I mean it that, and that uh, it shouldn't slide on the invulnerable rule played by mother and our uh, grandfather maybe uh, to save it our culture. I hope you will enjoy <laughs> to watching my film. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Reem. And this is such a beautiful example uh, with which to begin our discussion of the idea of um, artful living um, as something which is about the everyday and which is about uh, articulating resistance um, and resilience through creativity. So we're going to move now into our first panel, which is on the theme of narratives. We're exploring this because, as we've heard, the hostile environment is, in many ways, a narrative construction. Its very terminology, the narratives that it builds, are designed to create stress and fear. But the construction of alternative narratives is arguably one of the most powerful ways in which this environment can be contested. So, on this panel, you're going to hear from four speakers, each of whom will offer a different perspective on the role of narrative, and I will leave them to surprise you with these interventions. However, uh, I want to reveal a significant difference about how we're going to run our panels at this conference today. We're going to run them artfully. At the end of each presentation, you're not going to ask any questions of the presenter. They are going to ask a question of all of you. And after their presentations, you will immediately have three minutes to brainstorm that question on the paper in front of you. Your notes can be scrappy, messy, they don't be complete, they don't need to be complete, but please jot down whatever comes into your head. At the end of these uh, discussions, we will then open up to whole roundtable discussion within the room, because everyone here today has something of value to contribute, um, and we have a substantial amount of time for that discussion, 20 to 30 minutes, so you can use your notes as leaping off points for those ideas. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first of our speakers on this panel, and this is Tisfalem Yemane. Tisfalem is a refugee from Eritrea. He's currently working at the University of Liverpool as a postdoctoral research fellow on the Channel, Channel Crossings Research Project. Tisfalem is also a part-time PhD student at the University of Leeds, and in his PhD research, he tries to understand the factors that influence the destination preferences of Eritrean refugees and asylum seekers in the UK and their post-arrival experiences. And I will pass over to Tisfalem uh, to present uh, to us today. Thanks, Tisfalem. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anand, and thank you to the organizers. And hello, everyone. So uh, my name is Tess Fadal. Um, just finishing up my, my PhD project at the University of Liverpool. Um, so today's presentation, uh, it's, a, it's a brief presentation, so part of my PhD. Um, but in general, I just want to give you a very brief overview of what I'm doing in my PhD. So this is the title of my PhD. We are here because you're still there, uh, which is part of my, my uh, main research question. Why do you Eritrean refugees and, and uh, asylum seekers want to come to the UK and seek asylum. So what factors motivate their destinations to want to come to the UK? Um, okay, so three um, uh, research questions. Um, so what are the means and, and methods through which Eritreans form an outside imaginary of the UK, both from Eritrea, but also in during their migration journeys. What are some of the means through which an image of the UK is projected to the global public? And what are the factors and what are the main specific factors that motivate my research participants, Eritrean refugees and asylum seekers wanting to come to the UK? What, what shapes their destination preferences with regards to the UK? If you see the the migration routes from Africa, let's say, and from the Horn of Africa, tends to be Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, the Sahara Desert, Libya, Mediterranean Sea. So when they make it, when they make it to one of the European uh, Union member states, Italy, for example, it's relatively easy for overland uh, migration and, and, and mobility within within the European context. The UK is is, is geographically inaccessible. It's an island. And we talk about the channel crossing, for example. So what factors made someone determined and motivated to, to want to come to the UK? And the last one, which would be the subject of my, my brief intervention today is, so having come to the UK, having created those narratives, dreams, and hopes of the UK, what are their actual lived experiences at the Navigate, as colleagues have poetically uh, elaborated, what are their experiences 
as they navigate the different recognition regimes. The asylum regime being one, the refugee recognition regime being one, the journal of citizenship being another one. So I'll just focus on the asylum regime today, on the, on the asylum system, their experiences on the asylum system. Uh, just briefly, methodology, um, I did some structured interviews, it was qualitative. So I, I interviewed um, uh, 34 uh, participants and organized uh, three focus group discussions. I also interviewed eight uh, professionals who work in the refugee sector in general. So this is my presentation. I mean, what I do in this, in this chapter is, I, I don't even have to explain what the, 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 the structures of the hostile environment. So what I do, I, I argue in this chapter is, okay, given they consider the expenses and the kind of wretchedness they are subjected when they come to the UK, especially as they go through the asylum process. I am arguing in this chapter that the UK can be conceptualized as a colonial space insofar as the experiences of refugees and asylum seekers are ex and, uh, ex and concerned. And so I try to trace back some of the colonial technologies, structures and institutions, methods and mechanisms and modalities of punishment through which the post-colonial Britain has reformulated and recreated in, in the metropole. And so we have remarkable similarities between the damnness, the condemned, um, Econ uh, Ferraris Fano's work uh, and explanation and description of the colonial experience, and then the similar experiences by refugees in the post-colonial metropole, in the post-colonial Britain. So the question is, can we argue the UK is a post-colonial, post-national, post-racial space? at the expense of refugees and asylum seekers are concerned. So my argument is no. Um, and that's a, I will just focus on the first one, um, sorry, which is, oh, okay, experience under the asylum system and then the decision, the 28 days transition period, I will not uh, focus on it one, and then the ambivalent prayers of return to the homeland. So overall experience, what do they say? What do they think of the UK as their imagined suitable destination? So, um, the asylum experiences, and I've, I've just divided it into three, which is the dis dispersal, asylum dispersal, the involuntary asylum dispersal. As we all know, uh, asylum dispersals are involuntary in the UK, and I try to understand having someone being dispersed into a specific part of the UK, what are some of the expenses they face and the challenges they face? And as you can see from one of the participants, um, what happened was what we can call as the hyper-visibility, the simultaneous hyper-visibility and, and invisibility, hyper-visibilizing their presence, excessive visibility as France foreign policy, because of their uniqueness, as friends, as colleagues are were talking, because of the color of their skin, the amplification of their bodies, their presence, but also invisibilizing them because of distancing and puncturing the opportunities for them to be in places and the areas where they can benefit from their fellow refugee communities and refugee uh, organizations. So, Harabi uh, says, we, are, we, are, we were told by the housing officers not to venture out from the hostel. We were new in the area. The people did not know about refugees. They wanted us that. The refugees do not like, uh, the residents do not like refugees, especially black people. It was not safe. So if, if, in, in, in uh, Farhan's terms, he talks about what he calls the look, his physical look, his physical presence, and how it drew curiosity but also fear from what he calls the, the circle continue to grow in terms of people flocking into him to see his body. Uh, so, um, amplification of their bodies, the black and the asylum bodies in, in spaces where people were made vulnerable, fearful, and, and felt uh, unsafe. Um, but the, the denial and puncturing of the social support networks, they can benefit if they were to be dispersed in areas and places where there is a presence of refugee organizations, charity organizations, or their own fellow co-nationals, where they can benefit from the support, information, general mm -hmm. social awareness they can get. Um, and the social isolation and loneliness also related to that. Um, and then waiting. What does waiting do? Waiting through the asylum system. So invoking uh, for this idea of uh, the, the interplay between time, power, and waiting, then I conceptualize waiting as, as a necro necropolitical opportunity of punishment. And then people express their, the, 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 the challenge they face with waiting. 
the unknowability of their future. What does tomorrow hold for me? What is going to happen to me? Am I going to get a refusal? Is it going to be a yes? Am I going to be deported? This sort of loss of self-agency, uncertainty, unknowability, this terrifying feature of unknowing what happens to them also came up as an important, in terms of understanding and conceptualizing the asylum system as, as, a, as a necropolitical modality or technology of punishment, um, causing distress, anxiety, withdrawal, and, and mental health problems for, for many of the participants, and forcing sometimes uh, people to seek solace in drinking or other destructive uh, uh, habits. Um, and then enforced idleness. Um, under the asylum system, the, the policy that asylum seekers are not allowed to work. So what does it do to the self-worthiness, the se sense, of, um, sense of the self, of someone who is willing to work, but who is not allowed to work? So the idea of this material impoverishment, meaning that they, 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 they find it very, very difficult to live on 35, 39, 38, a day, but also the idea that they, they have the desire to work. They have the desire to work, be financially self-sufficient, contribute and give back, and sustain themselves and sustain their families. So what can I do with the 35 pounds a week? The only option I had was to, be, to beg for money. You know, I could not buy clothes and food, nor could I afford to travel, meet friends, or participate in social events. I had to ask my friends for money. It was humiliating. So we can, we can unpack this on, on so many levels. One of which is the, the immediate financial impoverishment, but also the kind of dignitary harm that causes on an individual who, because of the situation they are subjected to, cannot engage in what is called the reciprocal gift giving, being part of a community. The ability to buy tea to someone, the ability to invite someone, or the ability to attend a community events, for example. Many of them were telling me, you know, I deliberately avoid meeting people because I know I'm not in a financial position to reciprocate. That kind of dignitary harm was part of what came as, as, as explaining the asylum system again as a structure, as a decision of punishment. Um, so, uh, gift given, and then what it did is then make someone presence and existence in the world superfluous, as uh, Aaron and, and Fanon described, meaning not being, not in the world, not in the world as in the substantive, meaningful sense of that term. So kindness, uh, I, I was not so sure what to, to, to do with this one, uh, which is, what was the artfulness of some of the responses and coping mechanisms they have being subject to the challenge. So I came up with, uh, maybe I wanted to mention two things. One of which was, every, uh, almost all, all of them said, she was like my mom. He was like my dad. She was like my sister. He was like my brother. And they were saying this in relation to the kind of support, the kind of disarming love and kindness as foreign policy support they were getting from ordinary British citizens. She was like my mom. She's now my next of kin. Is it artful? What is the artfulness in this one? And what is, is, it, is it subaltern? Yes, it's subaltern given that people who support with refugees, people who raise the banner of refugees welcome and stop the ban, for example, are subjected to media vilification. And they, they operate within very constraining policy, legal, and institutional structure. So maybe there is an element of subalternity, artful form of resisting, contesting, and challenging the violent state institutions. And then, of course, within them, two minutes, yeah, I'll just try to wrap up. Um, the artfulness of their responses, which also resides within the community, migrant communities, refugee communities, would I, would, I would maybe summarize praying together, the power of prayer, as a collective healing therapeutic process. It's not only just about the afterlife, it's just about coming together and submitting to the heavenly authority in the absence of the early authority. So coming together, the prayers, coffee, coffee ceremony, I don't know if you're familiar with the Eritrean and Ethiopian coffee processes. It goes into rounds, round one, two, three, four, five. It's not only just drinking the coffee, it's, it's, it has, it's art, it's artful, 
but it's also about community issues, discussions, people coming together. So it's, it has this restorative essence where people come together, enjoy, talk about diasporic politics, hear community issues and the challenge, but also they come forward and support each other. And mourning together. Mourning is also a very, very important part of our community essence where there is a, 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 a family which is very big, the death of a, a loved one. People go there, take food, bring food, then it's politics, it's love stories, it's, it's a lot of stories. So I see these important community gatherings and events as artful <coughs> livings and artful responses to what has been uh, powerfully articulated at the hostile environment. And with that, I think I will conclude my presentation and proceed to my question. So, we know that Rwanda deal, as it has been commonly called. And my question to you to ask today is, and uh, maybe uh, bearing in mind the, the Palermo Protocol on trafficking, can we conceptualize, can you argue that, if implemented, the Rwanda deal constituted a state trafficking in persons? So who are the actors involved, and what do they intend to get from the, the partners, for example, and what, what consent and voices of those who are transported? So can we, can we conceptualize it as, 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 a, as a state sanctioned or is a state enacted um, trafficking in persons? And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's give this a go. You have three minutes to respond to what is initially quite a challenging but a really provocative question. So I'm going to set my timer. Feel free to add notes, think, talk, whatever you would like. Go.
Okay. Oh, that's three minutes. That's a good. That's a good amount of time. Well done for speaking. And now, stop. Okay. Thank you, guys. There will be lots more time to continue conversations in a moment. So we're now going to move on to Hira Aftal, who I am delighted is uh, joining us today. I've had the very great pleasure of meeting and working with Hira uh, in relation to multiple different roles and projects over the course of the year on Refugee Week via the Red Cross. She contributes a huge amount to Nottingham, so thank you for that. Hira Aftab is the founder of Our World 2, an organisation dedicated to rehumanising the narrative surrounding refugees and displaced communities around the world. She's also a communications expert in the humanitarian international development sector and is currently the strategic communications lead for the diaspora programme at the British Red Cross. She has experience working in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and the UK on projects ranging from refugee support to access to justice. She holds two master's degrees, an MA in International Relations from the University of Nottingham and an MSc in Humanitarianism, Conflict and Development from the University of Bath. And Kira is going to speak to you today about her wonderful project, Our World Two. Thank you, Kira. Hi everyone, and thank you Anna for the very kind introduction. So I'm Kara, and I'm the founder of an organization called Our World Two, which is a platform dedicated to rehumanizing the narrative surrounding refugees and displaced communities around the world. And for the session today, we have to answer how we're combating or responding to the hostile environment. And Our World Two specifically speaks to the use of language, the use of the language used to sustain the hostile environment. And this is namely the dehumanization of refugees and asylum seekers. And we do this through narrative storytelling. But it would be impossible to stand here and tell you how I arrived at the idea of Our World 2 without at first talking about the experiences, my experiences, the experiences of people around me, and the experiences of people who came before me. So to give you a bit of a background, I'm British Pakistani, and I'm from a few different places in Pakistan. But one of the places I'm from is Peshawar. And there's an area in Peshawar called Kissa Khani Bazaar. Now, if you translate that to English, it translates as Storyteller's Bazaar. So historically, people used to come here and exchange information about trade routes and about their daily lives. Unfortunately, it was also, in the 1900s, it was also the scene of a massacre where 400 people who rose up against the colonial powers were killed. This was, it was the same colonial powers who would later partition Pakistan and India and create one of the bloodiest partitions in human history. And it created million, and millions of people were made into refugees overnight. One of these refugees was my grandmother. Now, I didn't know her very well, but I've heard of her stories from my aunt, my mom, my uncles. And I understood how difficult and dangerous it was right after Pakistan was partitioned, and how difficult it was to integrate into a, con into a country that was so culturally similar to where they had even come from. But I had learned, and I would also learned that my aunts and uncles, despite never having been to Pakistan, could draw the red brick haveli, or the red brick house where my grandmother grew up. And these were the stories of displacement I grew up with. They were human and they were honest. Can I have the next slide, please? But now we fast forward to 2015. This was not what the rhetoric was in Europe. Swarm, illegal, and criminal were just some of the words used to describe people seeking sanctuary. And everyone seemed to have an opinion about why people were coming to Europe, and everyone seemed to be platformed apart from the people with the lived experience of displacement themselves. But it was still, after this, it was not until 2019 that the idea for Our World 2 was even considered. I went on a university trip to Camp Azuruk in Jordan, where Syrians were placed in some of the most inhospitable living conditions I have ever seen. And to give you an insight into this, there were people housed in the middle of a desert in corrugated metal sheets. Now, they were getting second and third degree burns when they used to touch the walls of this accommodation. So I was speaking to one of the engineers there who was tasked with making these living standards livable. And after a very lengthy conversation, I asked him why he doesn't just include the people in the camp. Surely they know the conditions better than anyone else. So he turned around and told me that all the good ones are gone. That raised, I was shocked to say the least, but that also raised a number of questions in my mind. Who is a good refugee and who gets to decide this criteria? So that's why Our World 2 was created. It's a space for people with lived experience of displacement to share their stories on their terms and a place where their voices will not be filtered. 
Now coming back to the hostile environment, the use of the words such as uncivilized, terrorists, and other to describe people seeking sanctuary has been used to sustain inhumane policies, which are still being pushed through parliament. It's also been used to scapegoat refugees and asylum seekers for political failures. But through interviewing people, we are creating these networks and these intercultural, intergenerational connections. However, one thing that did stand out to us was frequently politicians will allude to refugees and asylum seekers somehow being a threat to European values. But what are European values? And where have we seen this rhetoric used to sustain violence against people in the past? Can I please have the next slide? So another area of work our world too is involved in is raising awareness about the Bosnian genocide. And now you might be thinking, what does the Bosnian genocide have in common with the hostile environment? Allow me a moment to explain. So there's 10 stages of genocide, and the fourth stage of genocide is the use of dehumanizing language against a group of people. And nothing, the use of language is always deliberate. Nothing is spoken into a vacuum and is always very deliberately constructed, especially when describing a group of people. So in Europe, 50 years after, less than 50 years after the Holocaust, there was another genocide in Bosnia. From 1992 to 1995, systematic campaigns of violence were committed against Bosnian Muslims and other minorities in Bosnia. And this was after the dehumanizing language was used to portray this as normal. And just a few words that were used to dehumanize them were genetically inferior, inferior material, which is a, something we've seen that was literally just uttered during the Turkish elections to describe refugees and asylum seekers. They were also called incompatible others. Now the Bosnian genocide was presented to Europe as Croat and Serb nationalists protecting European values from, an Islamic, from Islamic extremism and from incompatible others. And the first time many Bosnian Muslims who are natively European heard of the term European values was when they were being ethnically cleansed from their homes. This dehumanizing language sustained and allowed for the creation of concentration camps and ethnic cleansing and genocide to be conducted in Europe in the 1990s, a period when most of us, or many of us, would have been alive. And it culminated in, eight, uh, it culminated in the Serbian genocide, which saw 8,372 Muslim men and boys killed in Europe. And this is what this flower symbolizes. And one specific example I will mention, and it is harrowing, I will warn you now, is the Sarajevo Safari. Now you might be asking, what could Safari possibly allude to in a war? Well, during the 90s, when, C when Sarajevo was under siege for 1,425 days, the longest siege in modern history, rich tourists from the US, from Italy and Canada, to name a few, used to pay Serb nationalists to, take, go, to go to sniper points above the city in Sarajevo, which is in a valley and kill civilians. They shot at people. They paid more to kill children. This is what language can lead to, and the sustained dehumanization against a group of people led to them literally be hunted like animals. And this is how our world is combating the hostile environment, through narrative storytelling, and putting the narrative back where it belongs, with the people themselves, rather than everyone else who seems to have an opinion. Can I have the next slide, please? But you'll have to skip one, the next one. It was the wrong order. Okay. Um, so storytelling is a way to show the humans behind the labels and statistics, while the hostile environment is trying to portray them as anything but human. But very quickly, we realized that we end up speaking into somewhat of an echo chamber, because there's, there's a great group of people who are engaged with promoting refugee rights, and a great group of people involved with promoting awareness about the Bosnian genocide. But we always end up speaking to each other. So we knew we needed a, different, a number of different mediums to address this. So we have narratives on our website, which we condense for social media, and we also have a podcast we call More Than Statistic. More recently, we're actually facilitating trips to Bosnia for people to learn from the survivors themselves. Now, can you please go back one slide? <laughs> Thank you. Um, storytelling is a revolutionary act, and it's a medium that people have been using for centuries to define themselves, and a medium which, people, which can allow people to look through people from the, look through someone else's eyes. And it also allows us to build connections and see we have more in common if we choose to look beyond the labels. And we also always have more in common with each other than we do with the people in power trying to, trying to push divisive narratives. Our world is a space for people who have lived experience of displacement to share their rage, their pain, their happiness, their hopes, and their dreams for the future. It's a, place, it's a platform to commemorate victims and stand in solidarity with survivors. 
It is a space for the collective voices of people who have been displaced across the world to remind people that the safety we take for granted every single day should be awarded to everyone around the world, regardless of their race, their nationality, or their gender. And everyone should have the same right to the life-saving assistance that we do, whether you're on a boat or whether you're on a submarine. Can I have the next slide, please? And finally, I want to leave you with this. We've all heard of never again. We've seen the hashtag, it trends a couple of times a year around certain dates. But never again is more than a hashtag. It has to come with a certain number of actions all of us have to embody and all our communities have to embody to ensure never again actually never happens again. So I will leave you with this, and my question to you actually, is how do you personally embody never again? And how do you work within your communities to ensure people are never dehumanized to the point that violence is legitimized and sustained against them? Thank you. So, a couple of minutes now to respond to that question. How can you, how can we ourselves embody never again? Go. You said it was a small question, but we'll resolve this in two minutes, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, time up. Please hold those thoughts for our roundtable discussion a little later on. We're going to keep things moving swiftly now to our next speaker, who is uh, Sebastian Bachelet. And if we could have Seb's slides up, please. Thank you. I'll introduce Sebastian now, so uh, if you could please leave your conversation to the end. Thank you. Seb Bachelet is a lecturer in social anthropology at the University of Manchester. His research interests include inegality, migration, advocacy, political subjectivity, as well as participatory and creative visual methods with a focus on the Maghreb, especially Morocco. Currently, he is a principal investigator on an ESRC project, Acts, Crimes of Solidarity, an ethnographic study of illegalization and criminalization amongst pro-migration activists and other citizens. Amazing project. He's a member of the Madar Network Plus Maghreb Action on Displacement and Rights. Thank you very much for the invitation. So we're going to move away from Bosnia to then Morocco and move away from language to visual arts here. But there are many parallels and many connections, so hopefully we can draw some out later on as well in the discussion. So I want to focus on migration, creative processes and advocacy in Morocco to illustrate how narratives of migration that challenge demands for authentic, truthful accounts from migrants can actually disrupt dominant and harmful 
uh, forms of representation when it comes to uh, asylum and migration in the Maghreb context here. But first of all, I want to zoom out a little bit, since we're not talking about the hostile environment in the UK. Images of overcrowded boats capsizing in the Mediterranean Sea are a regular feature of the news, like the fishing boat that sadly sank about 10 days ago with 750 people seeking safety off the Greek coast. But this week it was hard to overlook the gap between the coverage and rescue operation deployed for the refugees and on the other hand the effort to find a missing Titan submersible that was providing expensive frills to wealthy adventurers. Obviously all losses of lives are tragic, all lives deserve to be saved, but nevertheless, the gap illustrates plainly how some lives are more disposable than others, how some lives are more grievable than others, how the ability to cross borders, whether it's to find work, safety, just for fun, is not equally distributed and represented. We continue to hear about a crisis and listen to politicians' promises to crack down on smugglers and avoid further tragedies. But talks of crisis overlook the responsibilities and effects of European states' hostile migration politics, certainly the case here in the UK. But it also overlooks, and that's why I want to talk about a bit more here, the responsibilities of other countries like Turkey, like Morocco, who are collaborating in the violent enforcement of borders. Public debate seldom scrutinize the legal and political construction of some migrants, and here I'm using the term migrants very loosely, especially because of the Moroccan context. Construction migrants as illegal and undesirable. Nor do they provide sufficient insights into people's lives beyond abstract labels and Eurocentric concerns. As we've heard before, we need to bring back the storytelling to people's lives and people's own stories. And such discourses shed also little light on migration dynamics south of the Mediterranean Sea, in countries where European politicians often propose to build centers to externally process asylum claims. Rwanda, but also Morocco, where we've been talking about building centers for the past 20 years. Hostile environments across borders are entangled through transnational cooperation to police borders among states, and a wide range of private actors as well, but also through shared initiatives amongst activists, artists, to carve out spaces of artful dissent, where artful living, living and transformative potential can be crafted and shared. Next slide, please. So, just briefly, because we moved to a different country and I want to give you some insights into the context, but I'll be very brief. brief. Morocco is an ambiguous but important strategic partner, partner of European countries in the management of migration. Migration is entangled with also a whole wide range of other issues, uh, gas, fishing industry, agricultural treaties. And since the consolidation of uh, Europe's external borders in the 1990s, Morocco has seen growing numbers of migrants departing and transiting from its territory, from across the Maghreb region, but also from across sub-Saharan African regions. Migrants undertaking long and dangerous journeys to reach Europe clandestinely via the sea and via the Spanish enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla. Moroccan civil society and allies in other countries have denounced and documented violence against migrants and the routine infringement of their rights, especially for the stigmatized as black migrants from sub-Saharan Africa. The legacy of slavery and multiple racialized histories in post-colonial Morocco and the wider Maghreb region are entangled with the construction of spaces of mobility from which black bodies are excluded. And this was made very obvious um, earlier on this year, if you follow the news about um, a series of racist attacks and very hostile uh, discourses by politicians in Tunisia. But it was also brought to international attention when it comes to Morocco almost one year ago. Um, I don't know if you've heard about what happened on the 24th of June in 2022, when several thousand migrants tried to cross into Spain, resulting in dozens of people dying and dozens of people missing. Tomorrow will mark the one year anniversary. And to challenge narratives vilifying migrants and harmful representations in Morocco, practitioners, artists, activists have increasingly collaborated in projects deploying creative means, especially participatory arts-based methods. Events such as this lovely conference illustrates how transforming, uh, uh, how transformative um, drawing on the synergies between artistic and research practices can be. 
especially to facilitate the exploration and sharing of untold or marginalized stories. And these conversations are also happening in Morocco in a context marked by violence and limited space for dissent, so that's also very important. Participatory artistic projects have the power to amplify the voices and reflections, and not just testimonies of people as experts of their own life worlds, and not just confessing interviewees. There is no magic recipe to erase inequalities and hierarchies, but participatory arts-based projects can facilitate the disruption of dominant politics of invisibility that marginalize the voices, experiences, rights, and lives of migrants. This is especially important to address uh, the issue of truth and visibility. Dominant media are saturated with images of migrants. They are made um, hyper-visible, as we heard in the first presentation. Border technologies, think radars, x-rays, um, contribute to this relentless effort to enforce detection and exposure of migrants. At the same time, border politics also mean that migrants are invisibilized, forced to live in the shadows to avoid detection and escape discrimination. The lives of asylum seekers, refugees, border crossers are also significantly impacted and shaped by truth demands from authorities. They need to satisfy eligibility criteria to fit certain categories. To acquire recognition, to access protection, they have to expose wounded bodies, provide consistent, uh, consistent and credible stories, have their identity validated. Okay, the next slide, please. It's precisely this kind of truth demands and harmful modes of representation that we sought to address and challenge in a project that was called Arts for Advocacy, in, par in partnership with Morocco-based NGOs, artists, activists, and migrant associations. As part of a series of creative workshops, we collaborated with a group of citizens from sub-Saharan uh, uh, sub -sub -sub countries living in Morocco and Moroccan citizens to explore migration in a creative setting. Supported by visual artists, we set up sessions with participants using video, photography, and movement to focus on the construction of narratives and truth. Can I get the next one, please? This participatory project did not seek to elicit accounts akin to the kind of whole entire self-policing truth that migrants are urged to present when the authenticity and veracity of their stories are scrutinized by border guards, for instance, or when their own bodies are inspected by doctors to evaluate their age. The project did not seek out to provide a single linear verif verifiable narrative. Rather, the creative process departed from confessional accounts of migratory experiences, encouraging migrants' participants to express a plurality of reflections that shunned common expectations of coherent and chronological narratives. Could you skip the next three slides um, slowly, so I'll just show a couple of pictures. So the emphasis was on uh, polyvocality, on uh, fragmentation, not trying to provide a coherent, unifying narrative. Can you get to the next one, please? And the next one. And the next one. I'm regretting not showing you videos because I didn't realize we were going to be in such a big space with a massive project. So, but never mind. I've put the link before if you're interested. So this project led to an exhibition in an established gallery in the center of the Moroccan, you can stop there, of the Moroccan capital city, a few hundred meters from the king's palace and the parliament. The fragmented and polyphonic creative pieces carved out a space for themselves, making visible the bodies, faces, and voices of marginalized migrants and marginalized Moroccans. They hinged on the ambiguous and playful imperative to be really true, être vraiment vrai in French, to depart from confessional accounts of migratory experiences, confusing spectators and imposing their presence in the space associated with Moroccan and international elites. The exhibition required the public to acknowledge and engage with migrants' complex lives amidst fraught Moroccan politics, emphasizing that spectators were also participants in these complex and ambiguous intercultural encounters taking place every day in Morocco. The reflections and co collaborations between artists, activists, participants, researchers fostered through the project are further debates and praxis on transgressing truth demands and the politics of invisibility of migrants in Morocco and beyond. Creative processes do not offer straightforward solutions for empowerment and political recognition. They nevertheless offer powerful tools to scrutinize and challenge dominant politics and aesthetics of migration. We did this in this project by uh, challenging expectations around truth. 
The arts can sometimes be co-opted to sanction uh, existing politics. In Morocco, that's something that people talk a lot because there's a lot of funding from government funds uh, to use the arts as a form of entertainment when it comes to migration rather than critique. So the risk of co being co-opted is, is, is quite big, but that's something people are aware of. Nevertheless, Morocco has seen multiple initiatives seeking to deploy participatory creative tools to foster public debates and transform practices related to migration. And one notable example is this one, uh, a project called Look At Me by uh, Morocco, Moroccan cultural organization Minority Club. Um, they were part of, thank you, they were part of um, the Ask for Advocacy project and they've gone on to do really, really amazing work. This is the that's from the exhibition they, they had uh, in 2022 in Casablanca. I invite you to have a look at it. I don't have time to get into this. Got one minute left, right. The, the project sought to establish a migrant archive. Minority Globe uh, was trying to deploy transformative aesthetic practices, reshaping who is seen and who gets to be the one showing in the Moroccan public space. In bringing together different actors and practices, creative projects departing from dominant modes of representation hold the potential of speaking truth to the workings and effects of contemporary migration politics in Morocco, in the UK, and elsewhere. Oh, last slide, please. So I'm going to leave you with one question that's actually uh, coming from the, from the project I'm working on at the moment, which is more about the criminalization of solidarity and how hostile migration politics are also about intimidating and repressing NGO actors, activists, artists who are providing support to, um, uh, to migrants, refugees, asylum seekers. This presentation, uh, this invitation came maybe a month or two months too early for me to talk about this, but, but if you're interested, there will be stuff in there. But one, one of the conversations I keep having with people around issues about visibility with NGOs and, and, and friends and, and, and actors in Morocco is um, what are the dangers there? When does visibility have a potential to actually only serve the interest of people such as artists, such as researchers, such as activists, uh, but actually endanger wider migrant communities? How do we make sure that we are aware of this, uh, but keep pushing for innovative, transformative projects, being aware that sometimes visibility can be harmful? I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. A wonderfully provocative, resonant question for today. So, we will take two minutes to discuss this when we set up the next presentation. Thank you. When does visibility have the potential to serve the interests of artists, researchers, activists, but endanger wider migrant communities? Two minutes, please go.
Okay, two minutes is up. Please save these thoughts for our discussion after our final presentation on this panel. And I should say I'm really conscious we're running a little late. Uh, we're going to shift lunch to half past 12 um, because we have a little bit of um, wiggle room in the, in the program later on. So rest assured, you're still getting fed, don't worry. Okay, our final speaker for this panel is Naomi Wiles, who is speaking here today via her role at Adverse Canva, uh, which I'm very excited to be working with on a project with Ben Claren. And actually, we just found out yesterday that we've got through to the next stage of the Climate Action Bid, which would be uh, a participatory storytelling project with um, people seeking asylum, housed in hotels, and the Trent Rivers Trust. Watch this space. Uh, Adverse Camber is uh, an arts production company and registered charity based in Derbyshire that works across England, Wales, and internationally with contemporary oral storytellers and communities. The company's vision is that other worlds are possible and that storytelling can help people to share, repair, and transform themselves and their communities. Naomi Wilds founded Adverse Canva in 2006 and is the organisation's lead producer with Ali Stoneman, engagement producer, leading on co-creative projects. Naomi and Ali, also NTU alumni, I should say, uh, are currently co-managing Culture Cafe Tells Stories, a six-month project working with Derbyshire Virtual School and Learning Through Arts to provide storytelling activities for young people living in Nottingham who have come to the UK as unaccompanied asylum seekers. Naomi, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, yeah, Culture Cafe Tells Stories is a six-month pilot project which we've really just begun and we're working with 16 to 18-year-old young people who are living independently in Nottingham and have come to the UK as unaccompanied asylum seekers. It's a partnership between Adverse Canva, uh, our arts company specialising in contemporary oral storytelling, with Derbyshire Virtual School, the organisation responsible for education for young people in the care system, fostered and looked after children. And we've been working with them for about six years now. And the other partner is Learning Through Arts, which is a Derbyshire-based arts organisation run by Debbie Hedwig. Debbie Hedwig is a choreographer, a creative mentor. She's worked at Calais and she's fostered young unaccompanied asylum seekers herself. And she set up Culture Cafe as a Derbyshire monthly event. It's a social event where young people who are often living in rural communities can come together with their foster carers, um, have food, socialise, there's an arts activity, and it's an opportunity for people to meet up and share their stories together. And when we were asked to um, think about doing a project with the virtual school for looked after um, unaccompanied asylum seekers. The original plan was that we would be working in Derbyshire, but over the course of the year to 18 months that it took us to raise the funds to do the project, the number of uh, young people living independently in Nottingham increased. These are, there are now 20 or so, um, and increasing all the time, out of county young people who are on the Derbyshire Virtual Schools books, but are living independently with very little support, as we heard about earlier, um, they're not always in education, and um, the Derbyshire Virtual School felt there was a need for our activity to be based here in the city. Now, I'm a producer, which means I focus very much on the practical actions of how do we get an idea into reality, so I'm going to just share a bit of an example from the work that we're doing. And I think that question on the last um, presentation was very appropriate. When is it in our interest to do this work, and when is it actually in the... Uh, people who we see as recipients of our service. So for us as a company, um, we started out as a touring company commissioning shows that tour across the UK telling traditional myths and legends, epics and folk tales. We have also do sector support for storytellers who want to enhance their work as performers or in the community. And we lead engagement and co-creative projects. And we've set young people as our target group for those projects. And that's partly because we want our art form to sustain. We want our art form to sustain into the future. And we also are really conscious we want more global majority voices as part of that art form. And we've placed action research at the heart of our work. So in every project we do, we are talking to participants about what's working for them in that project. How do they want the project to evolve? So our work as a whole is, is very organic and evolving in that way. 
So what's happened in our project so far, we've had four sessions. Because we weren't originally planning to work in Nottingham, we had to approach Nottingham organisations to see who would help us to host it. And we were really, really delighted that Nottingham Playhouse, which is a theatre of sanctuary, just simply opened the door and said, yes, absolutely, we'd love to host you here. We're working with the lead artist, Seth Townsend, who you can see here. Um, Seth has a lot of experience working with refugees and asylum seekers. I'm going to read some of his words later. We also have a support artist, Aoife O'Connor, who's a poet. Uh, that's Debbie Hedewick there and Ali Stoneman and some of the young people. I think this was actually the first or second session. So we've got a number of creative practitioners and the sessions um, take the form of a general welcome. The young people who are participating are quite often different each time. And um, one of Seth's expertise as a storyteller is that he knows a lot of different languages. So he can welcome people in their own language as they come into the space. And we do warm-up games, a lot of physical activity, verbal games. And then Seth tells a story. And he tries to choose the story that's a folktale from one of the communities that are represented in the space. Some of the key words of that story, people get to tell us in their own language and we repeat that in, so we're all learning languages as part of the session. There are um, retellings of the story, they're simple folk tales that everybody gets to retell and reflect on as to what we've taken away from that story. And then there's food, which is a big part of the experience. Um, it's familiar, it's culturally specific, it's homemade by us. And then games, and then some evaluation, how was it for you? Um, that we ask for people to be really honest so that that can influence what we do in the next session. Um, and it's very much about getting to know each other. It's about community, it's about fun, it's about friendship. And yes, we do want people to feel more confident, to be able to speak, to be able to tell their own story, and also to have agency over that story. So part of the activity is about the listeners ultimately influencing the story that's being told, changing that story according to their own perspectives. So I'm, I'm just going to read out um, some of Seth's words, and this is from an example of some schools-based work that he has been doing. And this is just to illustrate the value of traditional storytelling as a methodology in this work. Much of my work is spent with refugees, people in exile, and their children and families. Often, where appropriate, there have been celebratory sharings at the end of a completed project, raising the profile of the refugee community and causing follow-on projects in the school for non-refugee children who want to share in the story of their classmates. At every stage in the storytelling work, there has been an emphasis on participants telling, retelling, remembering, voicing, singing the stories, most of which are traditional stories, most often from the refugee's own background. The telling of one's own story is a larger and more fraught issue. Sometimes when a refugee mother, in faltering English, or in her own language and English, with help from friends, is telling a traditional story about loss, loneliness, justice, it comes across so powerfully that everyone knows it's her story. She doesn't need to tell us that this did or didn't happen to her. We know that she is feeling the story through her own experience. Traditional stories are often a safe way of speaking the unspeakable, but the teller has the wonderful feeling of being heard. And he goes on to describe how within these projects, often it's him or his colleagues who are telling the stories, the participants interrupt and then reframe the story. And uh, although the focus um, and what we speak about is storytelling, often the feedback is that it's about being listened to. So just a couple of examples which I found um, particularly moving for me. Uh, in the very first time we met these young people in Nottingham, when we began the, the session, we were sitting in a circle, and it was a large circle that was kind of holding the, the sides of the room. And by the end of the night, after we shared the food and we'd had the stories, that circle was so much tighter. Everybody was huddled in together. The instrument was passed around the circle and people could um, speak or pass it on. And um, another issue was in the consent forms that we worked through the social workers to get young people's consent to be part of the session. 
Um, we do ask about trauma and any triggering issues that we should be aware of, and family very often comes up. And in one of the uh, feedbacks that we had from one of the young people themselves was they said they felt of Seth as, as a father or grandfather. <coughs> So for us, I feel that we're working with stories at at least three levels here. There's a very practical and useful element to working with stories, the language learning, which the young people want to do themselves. There's also a more metaphorical and subtle element to it of working with story to build that sense of agency. And as Seth was talking about, stories as a safe holding place for your personal experience. And then, as many other people have been talking about, there's these larger narrative frameworks um, for us as a company, it's about us being hospitable, it's about us welcoming people into our community, and, um, but it's also about how do we reconceptualise the value of people's experience and their voice, and the fact that, you know, I mean, it's very simplistic to say, but borders are a human invention, and the human impulse to hospitality and welcome is universal and very much should be. So um, we hope that the project will continue for many years. Uh, we already have young people mentoring other young people as they come through the project. And the question that I just wanted to leave us with is, are there some apparently small narrative shifts or changes in perspective which could collectively contribute to challenging this narrative of the hostile environment? Thank you to all of our panellists. And we're now going to open up to roundtable discussion with, I think, using this mic as the roving mic. Is that okay? Yeah? Okay, so uh, we have 10 to 15 minutes for roundtable discussion. And I think we'll use that final question as a leaping off point. But I invite you to report back, to generate ideas, share ideas, take the conversation wherever you want it to go. There are no uh, directions. So our final question was, are there any apparently small narrative changes or shifts in narrative that we can use or galvanise collectively to bring about change in the hostile environment? Um, that's a really provocative question. So, who is going to be incredibly brave and go first? Um, one of the people on our table, sorry, what's your name again? Sorry, um, said that, you know, migration has always been happening, and I suppose that's like one of the, like a small change that can really affect the narrative. It's like, it's not right now, this has been happening a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago, and when you sort of state that, oh, it has happened and it will happen again, people go, oh, yeah, I suppose so. And that very easy thing to accept completely changes the nature of the story because it's not really about, it's not really about right now, it's not really about these people from this country coming to our country, it's just about human movement. So that seems like a small change that makes a big difference. Thank you, what a brilliant place to start. So normalising migration as a human narrative rather than normalising the narrative of the hostile environment. Denormalising that, re-normalising the humanity of migration is a brilliant idea. Thank you. I think one of the, <coughs> I think one of the really useful ways of um, creating a narrative that counters the, 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 the hostile narrative is to find universal themes and um, working with uh, the women that I've worked with over about five years or more, then those universal themes that are also positive themes are things like food, music, um, things which are uh, rivers, rivers, language, children, lullaby, those are things which everybody has in common and everybody can can talk about, and they can talk about it without being forced into a victim mode, being forced into a personal um, narrative mode. Um, 
So I, I think that those, that universality gives, not only for those women of men too, but those groups that you work with, uh, it doesn't only give them um, a space, but it also enables everybody else to accept and understand the universality of human condition. Brilliant, thank you so much, absolutely. So narratives, as not just the stories that we tell, but the practices we enact, of practices that are every day, lullabies, coffee, food, music. Thank you. Um, I think leaping off that idea of univers universality, um, and we were talking a lot on our table about kind of the labels that get imposed on refugees in that, I guess, except at the moment with the exception of Ukraine, which in itself, you know, we think of Eastern Europe as its own little separation from Western Europe. But we have this idea of refugees predominantly coming from like, war-torn countries or Middle East or, you know, I guess what we term as the Orient, really. Um, when in fact, it only takes, you know, one natural disaster or one catastrophe in Britain for us to become refugees. It's not a case of where you're born or a conflict happening, it's a case of being displaced for whatever reason. So really all that makes, or what refugee is contingent on is just the idea of humanity. It's not any other condition, religion or nationality. It's just a label that's imposed on someone for the sake of legality and prevention of crossing borders. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you very much indeed. We've had three quite utopian visions there of universality. Would anyone, I challenge anyone to feed back on this notion of hostility as well. Did anyone on your tables talk about hostility, how the narrative of the hostile environment is perpetuated, how we can operate more effectively against this? Or am I killing the conversation if I direct it that way? Yeah, so put it back up again. What else did you say? is how many of the, oh, it's about the language, the language mainly in the media, government, the term hostile environment, she said, isn't as much a policy as a feeling, as a movement, but it's the words, right? So what if we create a dictionary for the narrative and we start to influence the way that people can talk about any of it? And I don't know what this looks like, I don't know who we're sharing it with, but it just strikes me that, you know, in any of my presentations, in any of my writing, I'm, replicating the language in a, in a way of pushing back on it, but I'm not necessarily proposing what we should be saying and the, and the creative and artful ways we can be narrating what's happening. Yeah, you know, let me talk to Suella and tell her, but saying that, say this sort of thing. Interesting, really interesting, yeah. And how do these terms translate in different languages mm -hmm. is what I'm always really interested to think about. Use my electric interventions tactics here. This table, tell me something, someone's. <laughs> but in a, in a way that is not detrimental to the individuals. But there was also a listening that you came up with. I feel like it's also very important because it's only when we listen that we can understand what else is going on in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. That's such an important idea, isn't it? The narratives can be there. The people can have the stories. They have the things to say having the platform and having the space and having the audience is another matter altogether, isn't it? Thank you. I was thinking of what Hera said about this whole idea of good refugees and bad refugees and this idea as well of good migrants and bad migrants. Like yesterday, I was at the Windrush 75 service. That idea that it was such a scandal because people came to this country 
and they contributed and that sort of economic layer to that support rather than just sort of seeing like well no human life is important it has that like capitalist layer of sort of like it's such a shame that these sort of this labour force has been treated so poorly in that sense. Thank you so much. This is a really interesting idea, isn't it? And it's one which our keynote speaker today, uh, Yegli Espiritu, is going to talk a little bit about these narratives of uh, refugee gratitude or ingratitude as being a very powerful way of pushing back against the idea that there are categories of legitimate refugee narratives and illegitimate. Anyone on this? Yes. Thank you. Um, I think also from a narrative perspective, we have done some research on it, and we need to distinguish between information, misinformation, and disinformation. And there is a huge difference between mis- and disinformation. Misinformation happens just because people are a bit sloppy thinkers or something. But then there are disinformation, which is particularly in the hostile environment, which has an ulterior motive to, to shift politically people's thoughts. But at the same time, we need to think that uh, as communities, diaspora communities, uh, we have also power to shift uh, narratives and bring in all those who are uh, in the societies who might have an interest to have this disinformation working for them. So rather than just only think about the diaspora, uh, narratives. We need to bring in also those who think they have a right to their own birthplace and think they are uh, threatened by people who come in. And basically all what, what others have said, we have much more human common, common things than the differences. And that needs to become a really important part to bring in those who are threatened, but also show you don't need to be threatened. There is much more accountability. Us, which is actually often the case. Fantastic, thank you so much. But of course, those narratives of division are imposed top down and perpetuated very deliberately. It's a huge question how we can go on us against that, Ursula. Thank you. So, on this table, we'll have a point to make, I believe. Does anyone have any questions for our panelists? We heard incredibly um, powerful presentations. And I was so struck in particular by Hira's point that I think you said the fourth stage of genocide is, can you remind us? It's dehumanization. Is dehumanization. So a big question for us today is whether we need to think about shifting the narrative on hostile environment to genocide. What happens, as Margaret says, and as we say over here when we shift the terminology, what happens when we start to think in terms of different narratives? Okay, it is lunchtime. That's been a very intense morning, but thank you so much. There'll be loads more time for conversation and contributions. We'll try to still come back at quarter past one if we possibly can to keep things on track, but see how we go. You're welcome, I think, to bring food back in here. Is that okay? Ish? Yeah, we'll be tidy. Um, food is out these doors and round to the right. And uh, please also do take time to look at the wonderful exhibition about Artful Living in Yemen, which has been provided courtesy of Yasmin Turn and Oxfam, who is here today. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you to all of our panellists, and thank you to you. Uh, please enjoy your lunch. for many reasons, but mostly because it aligns with my own research that looks closely at everyday spaces and places of forced migrants in film and literature. Like our speakers, I'm concerned with the lived spatial experiences of seeking sanctuary beyond the exceptional extremes which we often encounter forced migrants through the media, such as the camp, the sea, and the border wall. In Bell Hook's Art on My Mind, she talks about finding a poetics of space and the joy of thinking imaginatively about one's dwelling. 
The reality is that UK policy has stripped out that poetry and that joy for so many. It dictates that spaces given to refugees upon arrival must be hostile or the creepier rebrand re compliant. As such, we absolutely need artful interventions to offer spatial dignity and achieve spatial justice, to make space for Hook's poetics, joys, and imaginings to become possible. So now, on this panel, you will hear from four speakers slightly changed from the program. They're each nego negotiating environments in uniquely artful and impactful ways. Um, I'm gonna introduce just uh, what they're speaking about and then I'll um, introduce each one by one before they come up with their bios. So, Arya Suresh, Arya Suresh will begin by contextualizing the hostile environment that we've been talking about through her thoughtful and creative work on intersectional responses to the no recourse to public funds policy. Lou Armit will then share her research-based creative interventions to the gendered hostilities of immigration detention, which include podcasts and animations. Following Lou, Joanna McIntyre will present an alternative line forward. Refusing to accept a hostile environment, she has created a cultural placemaking project that seeks to support young forced migrants and their new communities to make new spaces together. And finally, Tom Western will discuss his work, Sounding Geographies of Belonging, Movement Methods and Creative Citizenships, one part of his activist and academic work focused on movements and migrations, cities and citizenships, relations and imaginations, activisms and anti-colonialisms. So, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Arya before she comes up. Arya is the recipient of a fully funded Nottingham Trent University PhD scholarship and a doctoral scholar at the School of Arts and Humanities with me. She is affili an affiliated research fellow at the International Institute of Migration and Development in India. Her research focuses on using the concept of intersectionality in the study of immigration policies and gender-based violence in the UK. She has previously been part of the European Commission's Euronet research on temporary transnationalism and has published papers on climate change, migrant issues in the Middle East, and wage dynamics for unskilled labor in the context of international migration. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Margaret, for that introduction, and thanks, Anna, for the opportunity. So, my name is Arya, and I'm an Indian, and I'm a PhD scholar at Nottingham Trent University. So, when we speak of artfully responding to hostility, I think it starts from understanding the issues holistically, and from a perspective that breaks stereotypes and popular imaginations. So I work on migration, gender, and gender-based violence. And the focus of my research is the no recourse to public funds policy in the UK and how it impacts the experiences of victim survivors of domestic violence from immigrant and uh, minoritized communities. It's not easy being an immigrant woman in the UK or anywhere in the transnational space because we constantly fight the burden of culture and religion and gender roles and marriage and children in the personal space, and we encounter racism and sexism and xenophobia in the outer society. When do we start speaking about the institutionalized racism that we speak? Are we visible in policies? Are our problems treated beyond culture? Can I have the first slide, please? We still live in a world where domestic violence among immigrant communities is often picturized as cultural and acts of deviant individuals and a crime. But do we understand the intersection of social, political, and legal aspects that comes with it? Every year, 2.4 million women are subject to domestic violence in England and Wales alone. And that's one third of all women globally who experience domestic violence in their lifetime. And it's not just physical. It can have long-standing impacts on their life when mental well-being, emotional distress, mental problems, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, so on and so forth. So what exactly is this problem with the no recourse to public funds? Can I have the next slide, please? The no recourse to public funds basically restricts one's access to public funds in this country if you are on an insecure visa category, which means you don't have an indefinite leave to remain in the UK. You cannot access funds which gives you the universal credit, a job seeker's allowance, a child support help, home seeking allowance, or even access to refuges when you flee an abusive relationship. About 1.76 million people in the UK have no access to public funds. 
and if a recent study is to believe, about 23% of the people with no recourse to public funds experience domestic violence in the UK. That's a really big number to talk about. But in the UK, we also have the Destitution Domestic Violence Concession and the Indefinite Leave to Remain, which is only accessible to people on spouse visas if you are a spouse to a British citizen. And that's not accessible to most people who fall in this category. So what happens to the people in the non-spouse visa categories, including students and employed people and spouses of people who are not British citizens? What happens to them? Why is it disproportionately disadvantages to immigrant women? Because it's not easy for them to report the crime in the first place. They could be deported. Their children could be taken away from them. They cannot access services because they're not fluent in English. The services, the response that they receive from the third sector, women's organizations and support services, are not culturally sensitive and trauma-informed. It's so difficult for them to even speak about it. And this is a clear case of immigration abuse, as I would like to call it. Next slide, please. So my research is basically about looking into how a policy that restricts your access to public funds can have an impact on your experience as a survivor or victim of domestic violence. So I don't want to go into the details of the methodology because it's, that's not what matters. What matters is the understanding. So I would like to look at it from a micro level based on survivor experiences, on a meso level, on how the organizations and the third sector understands the issue, and on a macro level, on how the policies are made. How is this conversation happening around? Are the voices heard? What these women think, what they experience? Does it transcend to policies? Are there real change in the society? Can I have the next slide, please? So to it, I think intersectionality is what matters. Intersectional understanding of their issues, where gender, race, immigration status, religion, age, disability, and countless other inequalities come in play. Is it even, is it even logical to distinguish between people based on their immigration status? So what are the arguments for restricting this access to public funds? They say you should not be a burden on the taxpayers. So are all these people just non-taxpaying, lazy immigrants who are trying to strip on uh, the resources of the state? No. About 60% of these people are taxpaying people, citizens, as I would like to call it. In this country, they're employed in productive sectors like education and health, but we don't have access to public funds. Another argument is that when you apply for your visa, you are expected to show some maintenance, some money in your bank accounts. So if you have a problem, go take it. Do you really believe that a person in an abusive relationship is financially independent? Do you really think that a person who lives with an abusive partner can access funds when and where they want it? No. That's a violation of human rights and just a right to live. And the organizations in the third sector are so pushed to their limits because they are so underfunded. They have no proper training to deal with these issues. They have absolutely no knowledge on the technicalities of the visa categories and the immigration policies and all sorts of things that come with it. So, can I have the next slide, please? Intersectionality is just the understanding that there is an ongoing complex and continuous interaction of singular identities of gender, race, and class, and all the other things that make you what you are. But it's always in constant and continuous interaction with social locations, religion, immigration status, your sexual orientation. And they keep creating systems of oppression and privilege. So not everyone's experience is the same. No one policy can fit everyone's needs. So how do we cater to the needs of more people? It's by understanding that they're different. It's by appreciating that they are different and their experiences are different and by making them heard in policies to understand the power struggles that they're going through. Can I have the next slide, please? So this approach could actually help us understand the power relations in society, how this conversation happens between a victim and the organizations and the policy makers and the larger universe. And treating inequalities as constantly shaping and complementing each other will help us represent more people in policies. Otherwise, we'll end up making policies that privilege one inequality over the other. Just how we think separating people based on their immigration status is a logical thing to do. And acknowledging this complexity of structural, legal, and practical factors is the first step towards addressing hostility. 
like my previous uh, speaker said, like the fourth stage of genocide. It's about dehumanizing people. So when you start looking at people as immigration statuses and visa categories, where goes their life? Where goes their human nature? What happens to them? So that's my research all about, and I look forward to contributing to it theoretically by making some advancement in the understanding of intersectionality and how it could be used in policies. And more importantly, I would like to take this conversation forward by learning how to record and respond to lived experiences of victim survivors of domestic violence. So the question that I would like to propose to the crowd is, where do you think we should draw this line between what's cultural and what is not without having, forcing people to compromise on their cultural identities? Where do we draw the line? Should we be cultural? What is cultural? What's not cultural? And should we give up on our culture? Me being here in an Indian costume today is, is my statement. Where do we draw this line? If I want to be an Indian in the transnational space and I still want to be part of the policies, be heard, where do we draw the line? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you have two minutes. We've cut the clock. You have two minutes to write down and chat amongst yourselves. Um, where do we draw the line on cultural identity for immigrants, migrants? Sorry to cut it short. We're going to have to wrap up and move on. I think these are just provocations, and we'll get into it at the end. So I want to introduce you to our next speaker. <laughs> Lou has focused the last 25 years of her working life on exploring the power of storytelling to generate voice and facilitate positive change. She has worked with people in prisons, children struggling in education, the terminally ill, women working on UN resolutions, FGM affected communities, and those held in immigration detention centers. The resulting artful interventions seek to provide a platform for important hidden stories to be heard and to engage those with lived experience and the power of their voice to affect change. Welcome, Will. Thank you um, so much for the opportunity to share at this important event. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, so I was really excited by the title of this conference when I first saw it, How Do We Artfully Respond to the UK's Hostile Environment? 
And initially, I, I assumed it was about the arts. Um, and, and then but I kept having this niggly thing in my head, the Artful Dodger from Oliver, and I thought, I think I better look this up. <laughs> and, um, and then when I, I, so I looked it up, and I found that it was defined as doing something skillfully, especially in a cunning way. So then I thought, well, I kind of know what cunning is, but I need to look that up as well. So how is this defined? And it's having or showing skill and achieving one's ends by deceit or evasion. So we all know that the hostile environment was consciously created. So if the government's response to immigration is essentially one of cunning, of generating false narratives for public consumption about the illegality of those that arrive unofficially on our shores, of prescribed criminal criminality through the use of prison-like immigration detention centres, of assumed motivation to abuse our welfare system and take our jobs, and contrary to our Human Rights Act, a presumption of guilt, then what is an artful response? Is meeting misrepresentation of the truth, truth with authentic stories enough? It's extraordinary that a whole population of people can at the same time be so regularly spoken about, fill so many news feeds and political debates, and be the hidden focus of huge public spending, and yet be so infrequently heard from. Are we artful simply by unpicking the mess that is presented to us by the government and mass media, discerning its intent and presenting counter-narratives? There's no e easy answer and no single approach to this, as we're in process, in the middle of this crisis of othering, desperately needing to recognise our oneness on both an individual, systematic and collective basis. But we need to start somewhere. So I'm speaking as a member of the Unchained Collective, which began when Francesca Esposito, a postdoctoral researcher from Westminster University, contacted the charity Beyond Detention. This slide, thank you. Um, the next slide, thanks, yeah. Where I was working at the time. A charity that worked with people detained at Yarlswood Immigration Removal Centre. So Francesca was engaged in research exploring the gendered harms of immigration detention. Next slide. For 20 years, Yarlswood was the only immigration removal centre in the country that detained women on a long-term basis. As a minority population, Francesca's research focused on the specific impacts that detention had on women. Beyond Detention as a charity was keen for any involvement in the research to lead to an opportunity to raise awareness in the general public and empower the voice of those we work alongside. We suggested that we work towards an output that went beyond academia and could take its key findings into the public to hopefully ca uh, counter the dominant media narrative and influence preconceptions, recognising that ultimately the government commits to policies that they think will appeal to the general population and get them re-elected. The result of our consultation was to create an animation using key audio clips from the research. And part, I think, of, of choosing animation was the fact that you can, you can choose to hide your identity if you wish. Um, this first scene was illustrated and animated by Elahe Zivada, who was detained on the island of Nauru for seven years. The second scene, that hopefully we'll see if the wi is working, um, is still at the storyboard stage. So the story takes us from an immigration raid um, at the main character's home through the dehumanising process of being scanned, fingerprinted, forming the identity card, having your phone and personal belongings removed, having a health check, through to trying to sleep and experiencing the terror of flashbacks and hearing people being taken for deportation outside in the middle of the night, to a walk through one of the corridors where our character experiences glimpses of the history of struggle, abuse, self-harm and protest through to moments of connection and solidarity with other women and those fighting for justice on the outside. The ad animation, however, ends in a full circle with a repeat of the immigration raid. The script was crafted collaborati collaboratively within the collective. Um, and we're still in the uh, process of fundraising to finish the animation. Um, but if, if it's possible to show um, the first two minutes.
um, especially if you've been abused, because most of the time it's us women that have been abused, and most of us here in detention have gone through domestic violence. Um, obviously, this is a removal center, and we think about being deported and being taken back to the sort of men you've been running away from, men that abuse you, you know, it just drives you crazy. The process of working on this has been deliberately slow um, and involved a gradual building up of the number of people engaged in the production and providing feedback. Uh, the collective now numbers over 15 people. Um, if you the next slide, please. Um, including eight people who've lived through immigration detention, uh, two academics, a couple of people from related charities, and a number of university students. Um, so you can see here this is uh, during a recording session. The project has also sought feedback from Beyond Detention's Friendship Group, a weekly online space made up entirely of people who've experienced immigration detention and facilitated by a member of the collective who was herself imprisoned and detained. The group of over 30 people have created a powerful space of mutual support and solidarity, which recognises the isolation and discrimination that those who have been detained can experience for years after release. We also took the project into schools, um, acknowledging that young people are, are our future and wanting to get feedback from them to ensure it communicates to that population. So their feedback on the animation led to a creation of a podcast series focusing on the damaging long-term impacts of immigration detention. So I'd like to finish by sharing the introduction to the podcasts as voiced by those who have lived through our dehumanising, criminalising and shameful immigration detention system. This final series will be hosted on the Border Criminology's website. Um, it's, sorry, it's the button in the middle somewhere. <laughs> yeah. All these women and all these people, they have, they have passed through a lot of trauma before even coming to UK. So, really, kind of uh, detaining them is kind of really traumatizing them again. They will be walking up and down the corridors in the night to clear their boots, you know, thumping on the floor. You couldn't sleep because they will be taking people uh, to deport them. In the night. The whole idea of a detention system. But they didn't tell me why I was detained. It's based on past experience of colonialism. They came out. I still now don't know why they detained. The detention made us to be alienated from each other. Nobody wanted anything to do with me because they felt I might have committed a crime. You labeled as a criminal. So I, I don't have any freedom. The wife stage of money involved in running this whole institution. And he does feel that people body men and women, you know, to be behind bars. Losing my identity, having to get adjusted to is an economic waste. You know, being called out through a number. I feel like I mean just a number. Is a human waste. You are unwanted. You feel like you are really not like a human being. We need to counterbalance the step is saying that I'm nobody. The negative figures of my immigration status. That means that coming out there that immigrants are nothing but a burden to society. And this hatred, we hate other people who are not English. I refuse to let, refuse to let their system break me. In knowledge, they say is power. Ignorance is a very big disease. I don't want to be a victim. Rather, I want to be a victim. So um, I think my question, which has probably been answered by, or already spoken about a lot, but is why is it important to unchain and amplify the voices of those who have lived through immigration detention to challenge the walls of silence intentionally built around detention centres?
Thank you so much. I think um, this is something Tom is going to pick up on quite a bit as well, the sound and the silence. Um, so yeah, please turn to the question and, and we'll have two minutes to talk and, and scribble down. the opportunity to talk about um, the Art of Belonging project, which out of the things that you mentioned is the thing that I'm going to be focusing on uh, today. Um, and I know there's a number of people in the room who know about the project and who ind indeed came to the exhibition, which I'll be referring to. So I'm really glad that you're all here and I'm sorry you have to hear it all again. Um, hopefully I'll say something slightly different this time. Um, I just want to say a word about the word belonging. Um, and I think I had a quite um, naive view of belonging being something that everybody wants and everybody aspires to. And I hadn't realised until this project how complex a word it actually is. Um, but before I go on to the complexity, and I might need to be reminded that I haven't dealt with the complexity because uh, I haven't got any notes in there, unfortunately, um, is I just want to say that belonging can't be done by an individual on their own. Belonging is a two-way process. So if we are trying to create societies where people can belong, then societies need to work with each other. So, so the research project was in response to what I thought was a call I would never be interested in, because the question was, what, is the, what are the problems 
faced by places affected by forced migration. And that was such a negatively viewed question. And I thought, there's nothing I can say in response to that. I'm not interested. But then I thought, oh, hang on a minute. Let's turn that. Let's turn that question. And let's say, how are places affected positively by forced migration? And so that's where this idea of belonging comes in. How can we help um, places to shift a little through encounters with those who are newly arrived and those who are already there? Um, it was a project uh, that brought together research um, that happened in Lund, uh, in Sweden, and Nottingham for here. Thank you. Um, so, just very, very quickly, there are two key theories that underpin the work. One is this notion of art as placemaking, and the idea that by doing art, by creating uh, art, you are affecting the places in which you're creating and doing that art. So, through art, you make place. And if you are doing art with others, then you're building points of connection as you're making places. And also, this very important notion of cultural capabilities, which looks at um, the young people that I've been working with who uh, are newly arrived to places as bringing with them skills and talents and experiences um, that should be celebrated, rather than being viewed as victims um, who, need, who, who are coming with problems that we need to deal with. So these are two very important theories uh, to the, underpinning the work. Um, I'm trying to compress what was actually a very, an 18-month project into a few slides, so I'm, I am skimming over quite a little bit here. But the first part of the project was for us to look at what was already happening in Nottingham and in Lund, and both cities were doing a wealth of work, as many people in this room will know, to support and promote and celebrate uh, those who are newly arrived into our communities. But what we wanted to understand was what was already happening and what, were, what did the stakeholders who were involved in that work think the benefits were so we could move forward. In those conversations, inevitably, um, came a whole host of barriers. Um, and these actually were when we were asking the question about how all young people that you're trying to work with um, in your arts and cultural programming, what are the barriers, what's stopping them getting involved? And I'm not going to go through that long list there. But I think you can see that that is a heavy list of barriers for young people's participation in arts-based activities in, in each of the cities. And that, those, those barriers are exacerbated by those who are marginalised, such as um, for those on forced migration journeys. we we'll move forward. But one of the key things that we wanted to ask um, people working in these spaces with young people was, what do they understand by the notion of cultural citizenship? Um, and you can see here there's a whole range of different things, but the things that leap out to me is this notion that, in that first bullet point, you can contribute, you can enhance uh, a landscape through cultural activity, but that citizenship, cultural citizenship is different for everybody, and it is partly a sense of belonging. We didn't use the word belonging in our questions. It's about what you bring to the place you live in and what you can learn from that place. So that's starting to get a little bit into this kind of dialogic uh, idea of belonging. And the feeling you can connect to others and be, hope, be open with others through arts and cultural activities. So we just kind of kept that in the back of our minds as we were working through the project. And we can move forward a little bit. Um, so the work was heavily informed by an initiative that's, all, that's ongoing in Nottingham. Um, which is led by the Challenge Board, and again, many of you will, will either be part of that or, or, or have heard about it. And the Challenge Board brings together arts and cultural partners with education partners in the city. And the ambition is that by the end of a child's school life in Nottingham, they will have had a variety of cultural experiences so that they feel that they are um, connected to and valued by their city and that those cultural spaces are for them. The cultural rucksack comes from a Norwegian uh, concept, which has actually been critiqued because it's really about elite forms of culture. Um, and it's about educating Norwegian children into elite forms of culture as consumers. But Nottingham um, and the Challenge Board have really turned that on its head. And they're looking at um, culture with a small C, a capital C, um, informal culture, formal culture, um, formal cultural organisations and arts institutions and informal spaces. And what they're looking at is how do we look at the rich tapestry of the cultural life the city has to offer and help young people to feel a part of it. We could move forward. But of course, if you're a new arrival um, and, you've arri and you've arrived as a refugee or an asylum seeking young person from the age of 15 to 19, you're not going to have had that rich experience because you've arrived too late to have encountered that. Or you may well not be able to get into an educational setting. The young people, so we wanted to think about how might we take that idea of the cultural rucksack and expand it and work on it with 
um, people in Nottingham in London as part of this funded project. And in Nottingham, we worked with NEST. So NEST is a bespoke educational provision. Um, it, it's completely unique in the country um, that um, supports uh, edu the education uh, for asylum seekers and refugee young people in, in our city who can't access formal education because there are various barriers to, to, to bureaucracies stopping them on that way. I just want to pause a minute, uh, because Jane Daffy, who's the inspiration behind NEST, is in the room, and I just want to say, uh, NEST, NEST wouldn't exist without Jane's work, and those of us in the city who know NEST know what, how, what a different it is. And people we spoke to in this project talked about life pre-NEST and post-NEST, and the impact of NEST on, on these 15 to 19 year olds coming into the city. So we wanted to look at this idea of the cultural rucksack, not as the young new arrivals coming in with empty rucksacks, they come in with rucksacks. And, and we wanted to see what's in their rucksack, what can we add to their rucksack, what can we learn from their rucksack. And we did that, sorry, we did that through um, working on a programme of activities um, in both Lund and Nottingham. Uh, and in Nottingham we worked with Ruth Lewis-Jones, who was then working at the New Art Exchange, and uh, with the artist Shamila Shady, some of you may know Shamila, and they put on a whole, they, they wrote and contacted through all their networks all of the different organisations in the city, both formal and informal, who are working uh, in cultural and arts encounters and activities with young people and said, would you like to be involved in this programme? Everybody said yes. Um, and so through um, uh, this programme, the young people were taken into these places, but they were not taken just to be consumers in those places. They weren't just there to... Oh my goodness, Sorry. really. Uh, I'm like, um, the important thing was they were consumers of art as part of this process, but they were producers of art as part of this process. And you can see the range of things that was going on, and it was echoed in London as well. Let's move forward really quickly. <laughs> um, the work finished in a public exhibition at the New Art Exchange uh, uh, in Nottingham and the Couturin Exchange in Lund, uh, where members of the general public came in. And I should say that when I talked about meeting the general public, this was happening in those art spaces. In Snenton Market, for example, that, that we, we, create, we think, thought of that as a, as a creative space, or in the more formal spaces. And members of the public would come and ask what was happening and talk to the young people. And during the exhibition, the final exhibition, the young people showcased their work. They talked about their work. They explained their work. Move forward, please. Um, let's keep moving forward on that one. Um, so, uh, just very, very quickly then, um, this notion of a sense of belonging... Um, I think what we realised was that belonging was a spatial thing, it's about getting to know a place, but it's also a relational and emotional thing. Um, and through these pro this project, they were beginning to understand, especially in Sweden, where the culture is quite hidden in terms of expectations of behaviour, that through this project they were learning how to be in Sweden, how to be in these arts uh, places. Um, and what we found was that um, this notion of cultural citizenship, to be and live in the city that you've moved to and be welcomed as, a, as an active cultural citizen, didn't replace, obviously, being a legal citizen, but it went some way towards helping these young people feel, this is a place I can be and I can have a potential future in. Moving forward. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just going to... This picture uh, is of... The birds represent migration but the birds represent teenage migrants. And the young person said, all teenagers like pizza, so the birds are carrying pizza and dropping it over the city. Um, I really like the, just one of the quote in the middle in red, um, was about how by going to these important places in the city, they were beginning to understand the history of the city. But what I really like is, and I am part of it now. I am part of that history. We can move forward. Um, there was an awful lot that, and I could spend the next hour and a half talking to you about what we learned about how this project enabled them to um, talk about and develop a sense of positive well-being. What we hadn't realised, I think, any of us who've worked closely with young new arrivals, is the, the, the acute sense of loneliness. Um, and they talked about how, in the interviews with me, before this project, they were going home, even though they'd been at Nest and, and, and all of that, but going home at night to a room that had nothing. They had no belongings, nothing they could furnish it with. Um, especially those who'd come unaccompanied. But through this, they were given this, they were being encouraged to develop the skills, they were given the resources to make their places beautiful. Um, I, I have colour in my house now. Okay, move forward. Um, so, um, none of them had done any artwork before, uh, but this allowed them to showcase that they belong and that they, that they can be artists. It allowed the general public who came to the exhibitions or to the sites to see what they could do and their potential to contribute. Um, it showed uh, how we can develop existing talent that maybe the young people didn't know they had. 
but it also had an important impact on well-being. Do you want to move forward? Um, what we really noticed was that by recognising what young migrants bring with them to the rich cultural experience and skills that they already have, they can enhance the cultural fabric of their new places. Um, and they were really, really um, um, valued by those people who came to the exhibition. Um, so I'm nearly going to finish, but so pleased you're here in our city, your city. Thank you for your contribution to the exhibition. I'm going to keep moving forward, but because um, <laughs> I want to get to my last slide. Um, so, there's a whole host of, of things here about why this is a good thing to do. Keep moving forward. I've got a policy brief at the back if you're interested in finding out more. Um, and there's a website. You keep moving on. Um, but just to say, we're trying to keep this work going and not have it as a one-off that was funded by some external research project funding. Um, Nottingham are working really closely with us. They've already extended this for Ukrainian children. And in Lund, they've got a new programme called Arts Inclusive, which builds on what we've been doing. I'm currently working on a project where we're working with people in the city, in the leaders in the city, and with the Challenge Board again, and with those supporting um, those with lived experience, to think about how can we generate ground up policy to embed this kind of programming. So there's a package of welcome through arts and creative activity for all those who are newly arrived into the city. I think that might be it. So my question is, what's the role of art and culture in co-creating places of sanctuary? And I apologise, that was so quick. <laughs> feel so cruel to cut people off from thinking and <laughs> creating. Thank you so much. It was fascinating. Um, and I think there's a lot to talk about. So let's do two minutes on the role of art and culture in co-creating places of sanctuary, keeping in mind that this panel is about environments and space and really digging into that. So go for it. different places, but yeah. I, I wanted to use it mm. with this particular yeah, really like that because it, it is a real soul to the mm -hmm. S-A-L-E, soul yeah. so, to all the complexities of legal citizenship and how that excludes what is this influence. Yeah. I also wanted to say you're um, calling it the, the crisis of othering. Yeah. It's such a good spin on the migrant crisis, like making it something yeah. their problem, but instead it's our problem yeah. to make some other yeah. word. And you, without knowing, what the hell? How did you think? <laughs> yeah. It was so impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It was stupid and not I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I can't <laughs>
He works in Athens, Greece, where he's involved in various forms of creative and collaborative research and movement building. Tom is a member of the Syrian and Greek Youth Forum, with whom he runs the Citizen Sound Archive, a space for amplifying citizen citizenship work, youth activism, community mobilizing, and collective research and knowledge production. So welcome, Tom. Thank you. 10 minutes, I'm tough, okay? <laughs> Thanks so much, Margaret. Um, Thank you, Alan and Anna, for organizing and hosting this amazing event. Like, it's really fantastic, actually. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be here to be part of it. Um, so if I could have my first slide, I wanted to start with a few lines from a poem by René Trevino. A border, like race, is a cruel fiction, maintained by constant policing violence, always threatening a new map. And my contribution today takes this point as its starting point, and it tries to tell two places together. Um, I work in Athens in Greece, but I really also wanted to speak to the theme of the UK, so I've given myself a slightly challenging task of thinking those places together in 10 minutes. Um, so if I could have my next slide, please. These two places, um, if I could have my slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, these two places are bound together in the most violent ways where the border is a shared practice of cruelty, securitization, pushbacks, detention centers, and so on. What's happening here is a wicked variation on what's happening in Greece and has been happening for a while. A hostile environment, perhaps ironically, is a hyper-nationalist enterprise, but also an international system that circulates. Priti Patel, the last Home Secretary, went on a few knowledge-gathering visits to Greece uh, learning about the latest methods in making life unlivable. This is a picture of her and the Greek migration minister, Notis Mitarakis, on the island of Samos, where they're looking at the plans for a new prison, basically. It's a terrible feedback loop, and we know the results. What I want to do in this talk, though, is to focus on something more hopeful or artful, um, things that also tell these two places together and find ways to creatively resist these hostile environments. So I'm going to detail a couple of things that I'm part of in Athens, and I'll try and bring these things back to the UK, thinking and picking up on the themes of the previous talks, thinking about geographies of belonging, how people unmake and remake the logics of citizenship, and about building what I want to call movement methods, um, much of which will have a focus on sound as a tool of doing this work. Um, if I could have my next slide, please. Athens. The border does not just exist at the border. It exists in urban space. It plays out in everyday life. It is written onto people's bodies. For the last few years, the migration minister, Nons Mutarakis, the Greek Minister of Migration and Asylum, has been working to close the refugee camps around Athens and to move people to closed facilities away from the city. Also to close the squats and community centers that provided a sense of sociality for people, to police the presence of people who've crossed borders in the city, and to make anti-border work almost impossible. He calls it, and I quote from this tweet, returning the space to the Athenians, in which he's clearly drawing a border around who belongs in the city, and a border which is drawn on racial lines, language, religion, ethno-national lines. But beneath this border work, people map themselves into the city. In 2018, and if I could have my next slide please, I was invited to join an organization called the Syrian and Greek Youth Forum, at that point being set up in Athens by people from, primarily from Damascus in Syria. My colleagues who are now some of my dearest friends gathered a team of people from various backgrounds who shared similar ideas on questions of cities and citizenships movements and mobilities, cultures and creativities. Uh, we've been busy, we've done a bunch of things that I won't talk about now, but from the beginning we decided to record our movement and our movement building. And a year later, and if I could have my next slide please, we started our citizen sound archive. Again, the word citizen is important here. Um, my colleagues, even though most of them are still not legal Greek citizens, decided they were citizens from the moment they arrived in Athens and used this word very deliberately in that sense. And so the archive is intended as a kind of storehouse and sounding board for methods of the public, for youth activism, community mobilizing, and collective research. But rather than thinking of this just as a form of documentation, we think of this space as a form of intervention. We use sound recording as our medium, we've 
made projects about new Athenian identities that emerged through migration, about how multiple cities exist in Athens now based on old entanglements of cultures and people and on newer creativities developed through displacement. If I could have my next slide, please. Our most recent project was this Mediterradio, it's probably like a dumb word, but we went with it anyway, <laughs> <laughs> which sounds out layers of history and Mediterranean relations, bringing places closer together that are usually considered apart. Athens is Damascus, is Beirut, is Alexandria, is Palestine. And we show how Athens, perhaps rather than being this kind of cradle of European civilization as it's so often positioned, is an Eastern Mediterranean city and sound connects those cities around and those cultures around the sea that have been connected together for a very long time. If I could have my next slide please. Our next thing is a project on dance um, and we're calling it Anti-Border Choreographies um, and this is precisely because the dancers in our team from Greece and from Syria have been putting traditional Greek dancers together with Arabic uh, Dabke um, making new dances that are deliberately out of step with the restrictive rhythms of national citizenship. The two dancers share the same shape of the open circle and you can combine footwork to kind of make anti-border choreographies. So we're saying that it's the colonial map that turns the sea into a border and our work is to try to build collective responses to social and spatial injustice. These are geographies invented and inscribed at street level that write spaces into existence and that support free movement. So when I'm thinking about this in relation to the UK's hostile environment, we can maybe find similar ways of remaking geographies of belonging. The border, to go back to where I started, is a fiction. And if I could have my next slide, please. Where is the border on this map? If I could have my next slide, please. Where I live now, in Kilburn in London, this act of questioning the exclusionary logics of Britishness are literally inscribed into the street. This is a billboard from the Kilburn High Road. We did not come to Britain, Britain came to us. Now, invoking histories of empire is, as we know, an important way of confronting the hostile environment. And this particular example brings to mind both um, Stuart Holt's always relevant line, uh, we are here because you were there, although I think I prefer what this column said before, which is, we are here because you are still there, right? <laughs> it's not a past tense equation. Um, again, referring to British imperialism, this in this case in the Caribbean, but so many places. And also this example brings to mind the work of geographer Doreen Massey, who also lived in Kilburn and wrote that, and I quote, it is or ought to be impossible even to begin thinking about the Kilburn High Road without bringing into play half of the world and a considerable amount of British imperialist history, end quote. And importantly, Massey said that this was true not just in London, but equally true everywhere in Britain, and she particularly singled out mining villages. And I want to add as an anecdote that um, I know from my granddad, who was a coal miner from around here actually, um, that the communities that worked in the mines were much more diverse than the usual representations of white working classes in the UK's industrial and post-industrial places. So what I'm saying is we need these stories, these geographies, these histories. Part of the work of the hostile environment is to erase, both literally and figuratively, the histories of diversity and the presence of minoritized communities around the country. The border is a fiction, and we can keep listening for and amplifying these counter archives of the nation. But we also need to go beyond just pointing to Britain's imperial histories as an end in itself. We need to remember that citizenship itself is also a border, a colonial project and product, an outcome of classifying people and placing us all into racial taxonomies and hierarchies. So part of creative resistance to hostile environments is to unmake and remake the very meanings of the word, the creativity of making worlds against its exclusionary logics. If I could have my next slide, please. In Athens, my colleagues claim and remake the word citizens, even though most of us are not defined as such by Greek law. This is a kind of citizenship that is more about relations with one another than our relations with the state. It's a support network, a web of mutual aid that fills the city. We also claim the word Athenians, so when we answer back to the migration minister who says returning the space of the Athenians, we say thank you very much, <laughs> we're already that. 
Um, so all of this is about decoupling ideas of citizenship from the nation, from national identities, from the nation state itself. A shift from coloniality to conviviality, changing citizenship from a status to a method. And we see these citizenships here in the UK too, of course. So many examples from today have been about these relational community citizenships. We see it in the mobilizations against raids and deportations, in the relations that hold communities together, in the daily practice of existing within and against the system that continues the colonial work of theft and brutality. And if I could have my next slide, please. I will finish by moving towards a question for us to think with. So, what ties these ideas together is the word movement and the different meanings that it has. Uh, movement both as migration and mobility of people, things and ideas, but movement also as the organizing work of social movements and political movements. And if we put both of these meanings together, we can get to something that understands geographies as always in motion and belonging as something that we make collectively not stuck in the static ideas of state and stasis. Next slide, please. And following the work of the brilliant scholar Catherine McKittrick, who writes in movements and uses this to, quote, refuse all modes of geographic belonging that are tied to racist and colonial knowledge systems, end quote. These are what I'm calling movement methods. And if I could have my last slide, please, I will stop with a question. If I could have my last slide, please. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, sorry, my bad. Um, the question is, how might we understand places, for example, neighborhood, city, or nation, if we take movement as our starting point? Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Um, Let's open it up. Uh, sorry, let's open it up. And um, I actually want to turn to the panel, and maybe you can have a go at kind of the first thought <laughs> of how might we understand places, environments that we're really kind of grappling with here um, if we take movement as our starting point. So maybe somebody on the panel wants to be the brave one. <laughs> I think if we pick up on, I'm sorry, a couple of you picked up on a conversation they'd had about movement always. Movement is part of being human. Mm. And so if we just take that as a given, then, um, then we accept that places, whether they're neighborhoods, cities or nations, will move. It, maybe not physically, mm. <laughs> but maybe they will. Um, but they'll, they'll be altered, they'll be changed by the movements that occur within them and across them and through them and, and so on. And that that's a really positive thing. I really love the idea of choreography and choreography in a, in a resistance or in a pushback, but also kind of, you know, thinking about how our government is choreographing movement too and kind of the ways that we can counter that. Uh, the, the photo dancing in the square is beautiful. It, it's really evocative of how movement can, can make places and also uh, reject or accept them. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else from the panel? Otherwise we'll... I just had a, a quote that really strongly came to mind <laughs> listening to your presentation, which for me just, yeah, it's kind of a different take on movement and it totally re redefines what is a country and what is our world. Um, and it's, uh, the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. Mm -hmm. So this idea that we belong to one earth mm -hmm. and sort of taking away mm -hmm. all of the movement, everything, so mm -hmm. <laughs> we just belong, so mm -hmm. yeah, just that mm -hmm. thought. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Can I do an Anna and come on into the middle? Would <laughs> anyone else like to kind of talk about the movement or any of the other questions? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for this. Uh, it, it really touches, like, it, it's great intellectually, but it really touches uh, on uh, use of uh, movement. Uh, I think. I think we might understand places if we take movement as our standing point from the point of responsibility. So feeling as refugee or someone seeking sanctuary, feeling responsible for wherever you are, uh, not 
because uh, places need to be given back, but because with this responsibility you grow this sense of entitlement, uh, worthiness, uh, and it challenges uh, that you get your right, what you're entitled to, uh, and then for you to build this sense of what's your duties. Uh, I think uh, it's a proactive, it's like nurturing a proactive um, role for people seeking sexually that they, they are empowered and they can uh, make wherever they go better. I, I borrowed something we used to say, I'll, be, I'll translate this in Arabic, it's uh, it's in Arabic, it means that wherever you're planted, uh, bloom. So uh, I think this is summarized. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very new idea for me, so <clears throat> we're not going to be informed. But I'm wondering about the word belonging. I'm wondering if we can't actually do some decoupling from the idea of belonging, because I think belonging is a problem um, because so many people feel that the place that they're living is the place that belongs to them and it doesn't belong to other people. And increasingly in my life, because of the things that I do, and in my family, because of the things that my family have done, there are multiple places in the world that I feel not necessarily that I belong to, but I love and I'm loved. And we're all moving around the world more and more. Some of us with freedom <coughs> and with money, and some of us without. But we all have multiple identities, multiple belonging, multiple loves. And I think that the word belonging is a, an ambivalent word, as well as as a positive one. Thank you. Yeah, maybe blooming rather than belonging. Where are the places they bloom? Did anyone else kind of off that? I warned my panel that I had a question. <laughs> so you're welcome to answer, but I wanted to open it up. And, and this, in, 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 as we're talking about listening and moving and belonging, and who else should be talking about this? Who else should we be hearing from? Or who should be hearing this? I mean, like, if I can invite every politician to the room, that, that'd be it, straight to the source. Um, but yeah, I'd like to hear from, from you. Is who, who is it that we should, we should listen to, but also that we should be talking to? And that might mean, broadly, politicians, or it might mean somebody you follow on Instagram and I should be following too, because you're learning a lot from them. So I'd really love to hear from you about that. Sorry, a bit slow, so can I just react back to what we were talking about just before? I thought, okay, <laughs> thanks for why I have to think through what I want to say. But I just wanted to react to you this point here, thinking about movements and cities and neighbors. I think it's very powerful because it probes, I mean, it, 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 it forces us to think about who has a say, who contributes, whose you know, who's agency is recognized in this movement. But I just want you to add that one of the important challenges there, one of the caveats, is that we also need to think about movement while carving out a space for the voices of people who are afraid of change or for the things which are worth holding on to and for things that we don't want to move, you know. Uh, for some people it may be, you know, not destroying this old Victorian building because we want to keep it because it needs to stay there because it should give way to something that's going to be replacing it. For other people it's more problematic, it's about keeping the neighborhood white. It's about, you know, there are all the things, there are different kind of levels of things that people don't want to change and we need to have frank, honest conversation about these things, what's worth keeping, what's worth, um, you know, living in place. I don't think this is the answer to your question, but um, just something I've also noticed, I actually grew up in the UK and I also grew up in Saudi Arabia, so I've seen kind of both sides of the spectrum. Um, one thing I want to say is there is an immense amount of privilege certain groups have when they move. For example, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. There were expat communities, um, largely white people who never, ever, ever bothered to integrate, never learned the language, never learned the culture. 
they just said our culture is better than everyone, we don't want to integrate. But then you have this overwhelming pressure from our immigrants, on refugees, on asylum seekers. When they come here, when they come to the US, Australia, you have to know the language, you have to do this, our culture is better than yours, you don't belong here, you don't do this. But then where's that same energy when uh, white people go to other countries, when humanitarians go to other countries? Where is this energy? I've never seen anyone not come up to me and talk, oh, I spent 10 years in Urdu. Say, how are you in Urdu to me then? Talk to me in my language, talk to me in Arabic, talk to me in any language but English. No. But we're still teaching English as a We're still teaching English as the global language in every country around the world. That makes no sense to me. So there's such a innate, there's an ingrained sense of movement as well. It's not the same for everyone across the world. And there's an unfair pressure put on immigrants, definitely coming to the global north, to integrate when we don't get that same level of respect when people come to our countries. So that's just something I wanted to add. Yeah, and there's a lot about Arya at the end, where you draw the line and, and in, in, in integration. About language, I was just telling her, you know, on video, it said uh, on the person's profile, language, fairly good. Mm -hmm. Who decides? Mm -hmm. uh, what's fairly good? Fairly good for what? For who? So language is, it, that's, even when it comes to movement and belongingness, I always tend to think that there's always somebody before you. You were not, you were never the first one for anything. Say in India, at, at, at right now we speak about the Hindu, like India belongs to Hindu. The irony is that the word Hindu was derived by British. There were no Hindus before the British came to India. So there, there are always people who precede us. We are never the first to be anywhere. We don't belong anywhere as the first. We are, we are always following someone else's footsteps. So belongingness, um, the, the ownership of anything, I don't really think any of that makes sense. If you... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I particularly love that uh, the movement is our starting point. And uh, because you asked uh, where, we take, where we could take something on, and um, I love being in the Cultural Revolution Society, where uh, movement is the starting point. <laughs> Indeed, uh, when we go back to the Anthropocene, and we need to think differently. And I think also from the cultural evolution going into the DNA code. If you go back into our DNA code, we have basically everyone's DNA in us. And those who are very strict about that they belong to that place have also DNA from those places where they actually don't want people to come to them. And that is what I really enjoy because uh, that needs to be brought home to those people. You have African blood, good men from Mansfield, if you don't want to have people there. So in that sense, I think we can learn a lot from cultural revolution, because our DNA code is made up from all people who are sitting in here as well, and, and not closing down borders. And borders are man-made in the worst way. These rulers, as we've just seen in one of these fantastic photos, and that has already been not very good for, for mankind using rulers when we, when we make orders. If anyone else, yeah. I think we might then end then. After that, we'll have a coffee break. And then we'll come back for another five minute picture. And then Alan's going to lead our final And to answer your whole question, is like, who should we ask? And I think there's kind of two groups of people who are going to have uh, unique insights into places um, and it's the people who have been there for the longest and it's the, the people who haven't been there for very long at all because if you've been there for a very long time then you get a feel for the ebbs and flows of that place like farmers know their land in a way that nobody who's passing through could possibly understand that land but likewise people who are just passing through and have no connection to it have no romantic vision of what that place is like they just see it as it is because they don't really care about this place. They're just looking at it. So I think in, in that way, it's, it is the people... I mean, it, it's difficult because it's like, on the one hand, it's First Nations people, like native people who maybe ha have got a knowledge of this land that is intergenerational over the course of hundreds or even thousands of years. But then likewise, it would be farming communities, you know, just like, say, in England, if you, you've inherited land for 10 generations, you're going to understand the land. Um, but then at the, at the same time, it's like refugees understand places in ways that 
we just don't because they travel through 10 countries with almost absolutely nothing. Um, there's no comforts of you know, hotels and well-managed roads and taxis. Like They know the land because they've walked a lot of that land. They know the people because they've had to grapple with those people in, in, in positions of absolute powerlessness. Um, so it, it, it's difficult. I think the people who know the land are the people who are the least privileged and the people who are the most privileged um, because they come from, they come from complete opposite ends of, um, of understanding. But then again, at the same time, you know, first, gen, first peoples are privileged or they're like, it's difficult, you know, I like, think <laughs> it's complicated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, please continue the conversation as you take a short break, um, five or ten minutes, and then make your way back in for um, the latter half of our session. Thank you. My beautiful city, I see in the streets of my beautiful city 
the dead who have been murdered here. I see them clearly, as clear as day, in the park that was the landscape of my childhood. I see them in front of the palaces and church gates of this beautiful city that gave them birth. I see them at the magnificent festivals where the most divine music in the world is played. I see them looking for the first pale violets of spring under the bright slender beech trees. I see them between the sun-drenched vines of the lush slopes that surround the city. I see them, and the sweet scent of flowers of this beautiful city turns to decay. I see that behind every window of the beautiful city, the constant ghosts are standing. And while one stone remains on top of another, their memory will still walk the streets of the city. They say nothing of all that happened. They do not complain or cry out. They are just there. The memory of everything I loved is boarded up now. My beautiful lost childhood is torn from my heart. Across borders and overseas, I only feel the immense pain of our wonderful father city, where so many people have died. Um, that would give me EU citizenship, which has to be a bonus since my son lives in Sweden and I could go and live there and be a citizen. But I had really mixed feelings about becoming an Austrian. My mother didn't come to terms with her past, my grandmother didn't come to terms with her past, and I haven't come to terms with it either. One of the other points that Maria Lanza made was about the effect of distance on those close relationships that we grew up with. And she's writing here in 1948, having last seen her community of friends in 1939. They then dispersed to Rio de Janeiro, to New York, to Hollywood, to England, to basically anywhere that would have them. And they tried to keep in touch in those days by letter. Emigrant distant correspondence. We took it rather easily. Goodbye, the world is wide and some of us have already started to make our mark upon it. If only the letters came back sooner, and when the war is over, it will take a while. But suddenly we realized we were wrong, and knowledge came, the bitter realization that between us lie lands, seas, and years. The small, inexplicable passage of time was absorbed by eternity. We certainly didn't lie to each other. Letters remained the only way to tell the truth. When the post came, on that day there was no complaint. We felt cheated on the days when no one wrote. Who doesn't like to write what has happened to them? We wrote across lands, seas and years. Meanwhile, the blue of the sky, the very air we breathed was different. The bread we ate was different. The misery we endured was different. Without saying much about it to each other, the dream of a future peace was different in the gay south and in the harsh north. Each of us grew old differently, which is why sad insight reminds me, between us lie lands, seas and years. I'm going to do one of my own poems for memory. Um, I have three foster children. It's difficult being a foster child. It's even more difficult being a foster child of an adult who doesn't really understand the England that they're living in. And this is based, it's called Other Mothers. Why can't you be like other mothers? Said my foster son, Jason. Why can't you be like other mothers? Other mothers buy familiar clothes so all their children look the same, and only we are different. Why can't you be like other mothers? Other mothers have a job that I can understand, a salary and a title that makes sense. Why can't you be like other mothers? 
Why can't you cook the food the English like to eat? Not soured yogurt and strange lingon berries. My mum spent a lot of time in Sweden. And again, we are different. Why can't we be like other families, with uncles, cousins, family galore? We have no one in this land, and only we are different. Why can't you be like other mothers? How did you come to walk this road, this road alone? It is my joy and task to walk it with you, and know that one day my child too will say, why can't you be like other mothers? Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, I love that uh, last point. Why can't you be like other mothers? Um, the third and final panel um, is the one that I'm going to be chairing. It's called Leading the Conversation. So if I could have Lorraine, please come and take a seat. We're going to follow kind of a different format altogether. So we'll take the first seat, and then Alex and Rubina, the second and the third seat. And then my main man, Oscar, the final seat. Because I live in Coventry. 
So I joined Kalag, and at Kalag, the main purpose of Kalag, Kalag is a peer-led self-help group of asylum seekers and refugees living in the region. So when I joined Kalag, I realized that uh, a lot of my friends in the group had lost their voice because of mental health issues and all the problems that we face as asylum seekers. Because even myself, the seven years wasn't easy. I've been refused, made homeless, to start again, and yeah, eventually we, we got there. So when I realized that there is need for us to speak out about what is going on, I never uh, looked back. So I call myself an activist because uh, I, I speak. I, I started uh, also writing initially articles because in uh, one time we had a session where uh, a journalist wanted stories from the community. So I said, I'll tell the story of homelessness because that's my problem, that's the problem of my community. But he said, ah, no, homeless for asylum seekers will not be appealing to British public. So that created a pain, like a wall in my heart. I was like, no, but that is my story. That's what I want to tell. So I went for a training at London College of Communication for one year because I wanted to learn to write. Yeah, so then I started the writing articles, one of the, the first articles was in The Guardian. So that gave me uh, courage to continue writing blogs and all of this and all of that. So yeah, I write articles, I've just, I also published my book. Um, I was not born a sad poet, which maybe I, I, I might read uh, a poem or two in there. And we, yeah, what else do I do, Alan, apart from <laughs> So as a group of people, Covid Asylum and Refugee Action Group, we do a lot of things. Like I said, homelessness is, uh, that's what our community has always said is our number one problem. Much as we like food, we like uh, other necessities, education and all, but homelessness always comes on top. So during the pandemic, much as there was everybody in police, some people were still not housed for some reason. Some people were made homeless during the pandemic, except for one reason or another, you didn't sign this form therefore or we were not last night we we're not here therefore so we started a project colored housing project so we still we are still running that housing project to house people who are homeless it's not enough for everyone but at least it's a starting point also during the pandemic the colored members who were living in a night shelter they were moved into a a house but they didn't have access to kitchen so we had to start a cooking project so it's kind of like different things as the needs arise so mostly yeah that's what we do thank you they will appreciate the mic okay uh, thank you so much what you do. I've got one question for you. <clears throat> you are an activist, a campaigner, an author, a poet, and a performer. I have seen you on stage at the University of Warwick, if you remember. Um, my question to you is, how do you see all of this, you know, how do you see all of your work actively responding to the UK's hostile environment, to people seeking sanctuary? Yeah, so I guess different people respond to different things. So some people, it's the poetry, some people say no, poetry is not my thing. So for me, what I find it helpful is, because I do different things and I get different feedback from different platforms, and to me that is enriching. So for example, we were in Sheffield just two days ago, where I was reading poems from my book because we had a Thing. One of the ladies said, I, I want to get your book so I can go and teach about what you have written in, in your book because she's also an artist. So for me, it's about how people respond to my work and go and do something about, uh, about it in their own communities. So in my language, there's a saying where we say there are many ways to kill a rat. You can use a stone, you can use a stick, you can use a whatever, you can step, stamp on it. So whichever way that works for somebody, as long as I'm able to do something, I, I, I feel like yeah, I've done my job. So yeah, I do different things. 
it's yeah i, I mean it, it may not be you know perfect but to me i feel like it is still works somehow as long as i get a reaction of, out of it yeah thank you so much yeah um before you go could you read a point for us i understand you've got something that you have prepared for us So, yeah, because this morning there has been a lot of talk, especially, I think it's a lecturer from Manchester University who talked about uh, how the drowning, the, uh, the, inc the accident, the tragedy in the Greek waters is being ignored. So I just thought I might read one of the poems that I wrote recently around death when one of our members died. So this poem is called Another Death is one death too many. Another death is one death too many. It's a tragedy. And it's not funny to see a life cut short, to see a family torn apart by the hands of crime. Another death is one death too many. It's a reminder that life is not a penny, it's a precious gift that we should cherish every day. Another death is one death too many. It's a call to action to do something, to make a difference and to stand up tall, to fight for justice and to give it our all. Another death is one death too many. But we can't let it be in vain. We can honor the fallen by standing up for what's right and by fighting for a future that is bright and fair. Another death is one death too many. But it doesn't have to be the end. We can come together. We can make a change. We can create a world where every life can mend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorraine. That was, uh, that was deep. Um, my, my next two participants, uh, they work together, but I want them to introduce themselves uh, separately. And I'm sure that they have prepared uh, something for us as well. So, Alex, we'll start with you and then to Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me here and uh, inviting me to have hope. So, my name is Alex. Um, I was born in Greece. I came to the UK when I was 20, and I traveled within the UK uh, a lot. I'm the publisher and the founder of The Other Side of Hope, which is a, a literary magazine. Um, we are a team of um, immigrants and refugees, and um, we publish um, poets and writers um, who are um, refugees and immigrants from all over the world. Um, we pay everyone. Um, we publish two issues every year. Uh, one in print and one online. Um, we've been going on since 2021. The project is uh, funded uh, by Arts Council England, um, which we thank them very much. Um, we have received so far, so we have, uh, so we, we operate as any other literary magazine and we want to be seen as a literary magazine that can stand next to any other literary magazine. Um, we um, so we have a submissions window which is opened uh, for um, for four months every year, uh, and people send us work. Uh, so far, we received for the past three years over two thousand submissions, um, and this year we, we received pieces from Kakuma refugee um, uh, camp, from refugee camps in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, and the project, I feel, is going well. Um, also, this year, what we're going to do is, is a pilot 
issue, which is very, very complicated. And so we, now we are open to submissions uh, for what we call the mother tongue, other tongue. So people who are refugees and immigrants, they can send poems only in their own language, whatever language that is. And then we publish an online issue um, with the original piece in their language and translate it into English. To do this, um, we created a, what we call Translations Advisory Board. So we asked people who were contributors before if they want to join the project. And so far, we cover 47 languages and we grow. If we, this is, uh, so if we manage to pull this one out, uh, we hope next year to, um, to publish another online issue and a print issue. Um, we have our patrons, uh, Lord of Dubs and A.M. Dasu. Uh, we have an ambassador, um, CPD Moafi, who is um, an, an actress who um, was born in a refugee camp in Germany and now she lives uh, in the US. Um, we started uh, with five people, I think, and we are about 14 now. Um, and everyone in the team, so social media, personal communications, everyone is a refugee or an immigrant who lives in the UK. Is that uh, okay? Yeah. Um, do you want me to read it? Um, let me ask you the question first and then. Oh, okay. okay. Um, the question that I the question that I have for you, Hamid, is the UK government is trying to push for asylum seekers to be sent to Rwanda and God knows where else. Right leaning newspapers reporting negatively on refugees and asylum seeker issues. How do you see your work, which would which would which I would say facilitates refugee voices through your magazine? How do you see your work responding to this hostile UK environment? Thank you. Um, I see our work as a literary magazine. I don't see it as... I know there's a bit of activism in the magazine, but I like words, I like sentences, I like poetry stories. Um, I know that most of the people who read the magazine are people that are here. So it's academics and people who work in refugee organizations. The people that I would like to reach is those who have negative um, views on refugees and immigrants. Um, and sometimes we, we call these people, you know, they might say bad things about, about refugees and immigrants. And then we start fighting them, you know. I don't think they are bad people, they just follow a narrative, you know, and they just repeat things that they, they don't mean them. So, I don't know how much time I have, I want to give an example. From, yeah, give us an example. So, um, when the first issue came out, I was living, I moved to Bolton, okay, and I was working in a hostel uh, with um, young homeless people. And I was sitting with a lady, a colleague, and we were looking outside the window, it was quiet, you know, and it was like Bronx outside, you know, like in the films. You know, there were drug dealers, everything was dirty, you know. I was a bit, because before I was living in Leicester, moved to Bolton, I felt the difference that it's a poorer place there, you okay? So as we well were looking, I asked her, what, um, why is Bolton like that, you know? And she told me, it's because of the refugees, okay? Now, when people tell me this, I, I respond in different ways. Sometimes I might engage in conversation. M many times I'm bored because I can't repeat the same things again. And it's not the right, sometimes not the right time to get back to them. So when the first issue came out and we were working again together one evening, I gave her a copy and I said, here it. And I see that the points, and she cried, you know. And I think this lady, she, she might have been saying bad things about refugees, but she's never met a refugee, she's never heard of a refugee, you know. So what I see, I'm not with a magazine, I don't want to say that refugees are good or bad. I'm, I'm, we are publishing poems and stories. You can read them and make up your mind, you know. It's about literature. Thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, quick one. Quick one. Uh,
little point from the second great uh, issue by um, a young refugee, uh, she's 20 years old, uh, who lives in Glasgow. And I, I like it a lot because about IKEA, it's about the going to IKEA. Can you get the mic out close? Yeah. Then? So the title of the poem is Me and My Family Get Lost in the IKEA Showrooms. <laughs> we visit the colorful rooms, the built-in kitchens, and the shiny wood garden lounges. We look at the graphics of children sitting around the dining table. Blown kids waiting to eat their lasagna. Blown kids with their parents' arms around their bodies. Happy blown kids. My mother likes to look at furniture. She says, oh, look how comfortable those bed looks. It could be a joy to sleep on them. Look at that bookshelf. We can finally fit all our books in one place. My mother never got to build a house of her own. It's been with her since bridehood, the urge to make a home. Walking through the showrooms, I do not know how to tell my mother that she has given birth to empty homes, begging to be occupied with love. Ikea is western, big and blue. It's too, it's too big for a refugee to grasp. It is the color of large borders that keep the people out and the furniture in. Me and my family are afraid of colorful rooms. We are afraid of shiny wood, of large dining tables that would fit us all. We'll never buy a comfortable bed nor a bookshelf to fit our books, not because we can't afford it, but rather because of the fear of finding out whether or not lasagna on the table makes a happy kid. Me and my family are afraid of each other. We cannot bear to know that we could make a home and still be missing. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, 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 is your name. Oh, can you get the mic out to please? Um, <clears throat> right, I'm Rubina. I came to England from Albania when I was 15. Uh, my mum married my stepdad, who she knew since they were two years old, and he loved her for 20 years before marrying her. Um, and he was already a resident here, so we got lucky, I guess. But my stepdad was a refugee when he left Albania at 19 um, and crossed the border to Greece on foot. And um, if you meet my stepdad, he is such a typical dad. He makes the worst jokes. Um, he's very loving. He cries at sad, sad films, but then pretends he doesn't. And recently we went on a trip for Father's Day and bought matching key rings with planes on them because we both like planes. When I told my friends that my stepdad was a refugee, they said, what? That he doesn't look like a refugee. He's a typical dad. And that's the first time that I started thinking about what, what does a refugee look like? Are they not fathers, mothers, children? Um, and that's why I'm part of the other side of hope, because I want people to realise that a refugee can be literally anyone. I'm going to ask you the same question, you know, um, and I don't want you to give the same response as Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I know you work for the same organization, but do you have a different perspective when it comes to uh, how you see your work actually responding to the hostile UK environment? Um, I think the biggest enabler of this hostile environment is the power of the media and of um, speaking about masses of people instead of individuals and dehumanizing refugees and migrants. And I think uh, the other side of hope is one example of a good response to that because we're responding to this dehumanization with humanization by giving these statistics a story and individuality. Thank you. So, um, can you read, can you read us? <laughs> <laughs> oh, can you? Can you? Oh, okay, um, 
can you read, read us a, a poem you have seen? So this is a poem I wrote recently. Um, growing up, my, my main sort of identity was um, I'm a feminist. I'm a feminist because I struggled as a woman in my life. My mother struggled very much as a woman. Um, and it was recently when I started working with the other side of folks that I thought a lot more about my own identity as a migrant. It's called, Are You Going Back Home? Are you going back home? To the place you left behind back when you were a child? Are you going back to sleep in your old blue bedroom? Blue, like the time you nearly drowned. Are you going back to the sea? Drown again, drown again, drown in your culture and the tongues of its people, loving misogyny. Drown with your mother. Are you going back to the trees? You know the ones, rooted. Unlike you, suffering instead of this loaded question, are you going back home? I hope the walls of your placid mind collapse, like my world did. I hope your roots hold you back forever, that you may drink your tea in, sat in the IKEA chair that I put together in my home, home, here, now, and ask me about back home. And I will tell you how beautiful the country of my birth is, and that I love it, I really do. I will tell you all the well-calculated details I can afford to tell, because I cannot criticise where I came from, when that is all the identity you will allow me. I cannot truly leave the collapsing walls of my past, when you won't let me call my home, my here, my now, home. But what do you know, you blissful? Are you going back home? You must miss it. I smile and nod, the thoughts flooding my throat. Of course, it's so nice, you should go sometime. Thank you so much for being there. Uh, I love that, I really love it. Um, last but not least is my dear friend, Usman Khalid. Um, let me tell you something about Usman that he doesn't know that uh, I wanted to say. Uh, when I was making that uh, film, that documentary film, as you can see, that's him uh, in that, uh, in, on that screen. I traveled to London and I met Usman for the first time. Unfortunately, the coffee machine in his, uh, in his, uh, in his coffee establishment wasn't working, <laughs> but I really only wanted. I understand he makes one of the best coffee. So, Usman, next time that I'm coming to London, please make sure that the coffee machine is working. <laughs> and now I want you to introduce yourself first, and then I want you to tell the audience what it is that you do, everything. Don't leave out anything. <laughs> and then, uh, I will ask you a question as well. Thank you. Um, so, uh, my, my name is Usman, and I, uh, so I'll start with 2015 then. Uh, so, in 2015, I was <laughs> sleeping in my room, uh, and uh, in 6 o'clock in the morning, I wake up with a loud noise, a bang, loud bang on the door, the front door, and it was some, something like someone was going to break the door, it was that loud. And before I could even figure out what's happening, there were like six or seven uh, people in uniform, and they, like, they came and they uh, entered into each room in the house, also including mine. And they uh, were very, very rude and very strict and asking for the papers, which I didn't have. Uh, so they, uh, then they, after a few questions, they took me uh, with them. Uh, for two and a half days, they kept me into the, uh, the local uh, police station in the cell and then after that they transferred me to Harmonsworth Detention Centre which is the biggest uh, 
detention center in the Europe. Uh, and I done my better, I was there. Uh, and so my case, my asylum case, I was fighting at that time and I was, I fought my case from inside the detention center. <laughs> Lucky I uh, won my case and, and on 8th of October 2015, I was a free man uh, with uh, papers in my hands, refugee st status in my hand. My time in detention was uh, something which is totally very different than the rest of the world. That is something when you go into the detention center as a detainee, of course, uh, you uh, it's, a, it's a different dimension, it's a different world altogether. There is nothing. Uh, uh, inside a detention center, which uh, you, which feels like that you are in a first world country, uh, it's anything but civilized uh, inside detention center. So, <laughs> when I came out, and uh, I, and this is, uh, I'm not just dramatizing it. It, it is true. I know, when I was coming out, I stopped for a bit. I was very, very happy that even then I stopped for a bit. I looked behind the building I was leaving and I was seeing the, the lights from the windows, the barred windows coming out and I thought for a minute uh, that there are still people inside. The, the, the people I, I was spending my evenings uh, in, uh, uh, and even this morning I was with them uh, and, and discussing our cases or discussing life or whatever. Uh, they're still inside, and uh, why? And I ask the question: Why they're inside, and why I'm outside? This. I'm no better than them, of course. Uh, they also have an equal and same right as I am to be free and to be. Uh, um, and I thought that in any capacity, whatever I do from now onwards, in any capacity, I will try to talk about the, these issues in any way possible. I joined this organization uh, as a volunteer uh, uh, detention action uh, uh, immediately after uh, where I had a chance to speak about detention. On, um, so detention action is an organization they challenge the government on the policy level uh, of detention. <laughs> I started working with them and through their panel, uh, through their platform I had a chance to speak uh, at different universities, I had a chance to speak, even uh, House of Commons as well. Um, but uh, one thing was uh, uh, I couldn't keep up working there because even though I was working there and I was free, I was while I was working with them, I was still mentally I was inside the detention center because I was still. It, it, I, I keep repeating the same story. I was keep repeating, so I didn't. I I was not brave enough to keep living that, uh, reliving that experience. Uh, so I uh, couldn't keep up working with them for, for long. Uh, uh, the next organization I joined as a, uh, as a, as a marketing intern was Counterpoints Arts. So Counterpoints Arts is an organization that work with, uh, uh, work with refugees and, uh, and they celebrate the contribution of refugees and migrants in the society uh, 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 with the help of uh, like, through, through, through arts and uh, uh, crafts and so So there, uh, when I was at Contemporary South, there when my real journey into the, the, the world of arts and, and refugee and arts started, because I learned a lot, I made so many connections, I made so many friends, I, and I learned a lot about the art, uh, art form in this country and how the migrant art an artist over the over the years and years and years shape up uh, the, the UK culture. Uh, uh, I, uh, during my time in the UK, I also developed uh, uh, a deep interest and a love uh, for the coffee and the coffee culture. And I really uh, believe that none, no other food or beverage is beverage can tell a better story of migration than coffee itself. Uh, so, 
I wanted to start and have, have a cafe of coffee shop, or coffee business of my own. So I joined those two together. I joined the, the love of coffee and the, my own experiences and the promise I made to myself uh, uh, when I was walking out of the detention. I joined them uh, 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 and uh, when the Haven Coffee <laughs> started. So Haven Coffee, in a nutshell, is a social enterprise where we serve ethically sourced fair trade specialty coffee to the local communities uh, with a social mission of uh, breaking the false narratives around refugees uh, uh, and asylum seekers into the uh, into the society with the help of visual and performing arts, as well as we also provide various trainings to refugees and asylum seekers so that they will be more employable in the society and get integrated into the society through the job market. I think it's enough details to do that. Yeah, um, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, but again, like I said earlier, I still haven't tasted your coffee. <laughs> but, um, I think I might have to come to London for that. I've got a question for you because the other thing that we talked about when I came to London was your comedy. You know, and uh, you even sent me clips, uh, you know, the YouTube clips of some of your performances. My question is uh, regarding that comedy. Uh, what is the role of comedy in our communities and indeed in our society? And how do you see it? How do you see its use in fighting against the hostile environment? That's a good question. My intellectual level is not that uh, to answer this question. Uh, or just, uh, do justice with this question, but I'll try. Uh, so, uh, the, re the reason why I, from where I see comedy, uh, is uh, an art form which has a bigger pitch to play on. Uh, when we talk about comedy, and uh, 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 we, we, we can, a, a comedian, a stand up comedian, or can say very sensitive things also and can, uh, can talk about things uh, in a way which where they can uh, send their message also without uh, without hurting anyone without be, a, being very direct so that is the beauty of uh, comedy uh, the, uh, this art form which i i think uh, uh, i really like uh, and uh, that was the, uh, that was the idea behind to get into the comedy myself. Uh, um, again, I, while I was working with counterpart <laughs> arts, they took this initiative. They uh, started uh, 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 started comedy workshops, uh, and they asked me if I want to be part of that uh, as a performer. Uh, so I I just said said yes. Uh, uh, and then I performed uh, a few gigs uh, uh, with them. Uh, but because on the side I was working on, towards on my uh, business also, on Haven Coffee as well. So I also joined that comedy with my business also. Uh, 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 and uh, so what we do now is we run two comedy gigs every year uh, and we also run uh, comedy workshops where we uh, try, uh, try to teach uh, the, the asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants uh, how to perform on the stage. Uh, why I want to do that? Why I want to? What? What it, it shows? It it shows that refugees are not the sorry figure. They they are pleasant people. They are uh, you don't you don't they don't need uh, our pity. We don't need to feel pity, uh, we need to give them space, that's it. Uh, we don't need to uh, go extra miles and take a pity on them. We just need to give them equal rights, which, what we have. And they are the, the, the people like you and me. Uh, 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 they also have a sense of humor. They, uh, it's not that refugees, not, just like I think some, one of you mentioned that what a refugee look like uh, now? Refugee looks like like the, the, the white refugees as well now. Too. So uh, 
but before people might think that all refugees might be just certain color and certain uh, certain uh, 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 they have certain kind of uh, traits or personality. They cannot speak English. I will tell you a uh, uh, story. I <laughs> in a few years ago, there's a producer come to us, and I was to contribute SARS. They wanted to. Uh, uh, have a refugee for their uh, morning show, uh, uh, and uh, Tom uh, from Conference Arts, he uh, put my name uh, to the producer. And when she, uh, we had a chat, and after that, the producer she uh, didn't take me on, and the reason she said that that oh, Usman is very good, but uh, his English is too good, and uh, he is uh, he doesn't look like uh, he's not a Syrian. So we don't. Uh, we need someone. So, so this. So this is like a, a thing. I, I took it as, as a compliment. That okay, my English is good. But uh, so th these narratives, uh, I, uh, I've been, I'm trying to break uh, through 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 the through the comedy, through the through the other art form. We 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 also worked uh, on. Uh, on uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a documentary also on hostile environment, but, uh, and we also run exhibitions as well, as well. But our main, uh, the, the biggest project we do is our comedy games. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my partner, uh, this individuals, like I say, they have helped me in developing the, a narrative based on creativity of refugees. And I truly appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Another big round of applause for these guys. Um, now we'll have a discussion. Okay. Um, any questions from you love the people too, my love the people. <laughs> Anyone? Anything? Thank you so much for sharing what you're doing. I'm wondering what the, not the biggest or one hurdle to accomplishing what you want and know can be impactful. So is it funding? Is it being in the right room? And I think maybe Speaking it out, maybe we can start to collectively problem solve. So, what's one one large or small hurdle that you're facing that maybe this guy can help you with, or maybe? <laughs> when I when I was writing the poems, because at the time I was an asylum seeker, so the biggest problem was that. In our group, I was the chairperson of color. So as a chair, you oversee everything in the group, and our group is big. So much as I'm dealing with the real issues in real life during the pandemic, but I also wanted this time and space and head space to write. It was hard. So it's the exhaustion that I was going through that to me was the problem. So I just wish that there was no hostile environment where everyone had access to food, health, and like everyone else, like the, when pandemic, uh, pandemic hit. But now that see, I'm out of that, <laughs> I guess, it, yeah, mental health to me still comes on number one, like self-care kind of stuff. Like, so how do we get back after long years of living in fear, stress, and anxiety, how do we heal? To me, that is the, the issue that I have. Thank you. Uh, for me, the main thing is uh, funding and stability. Um, we, we, each year we apply, but you know, now next year we might not get it. Um, and the project might have to stop. So it is a funding. Mm. Kind of following up on that, uh, also um, amplifying a reach, and um, that's always going to be an issue in arts and um, 
so I think, like, answering the question of the question, um, what can you or us, even as an audience, do um, not just to um, passively listen, but actually make sure that um, word spreads out at the very least, or um, that we act on what we listen to? Yep, pretty much the same things, but uh, for me, like, uh, I am just, uh, just by myself, so uh, sometimes it's very overwhelming for me uh, when I'm looking towards the business also, as we are social enterprises, we, we are not a charity, so we have a business to run as well, and then these social things, so some, some, somewhere down the line I need to uh, 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 see that how much the percentage I need to give of my time to the business and what percentage I need to give, uh, which I'm not very efficient at the moment uh, uh, because I'm just, at the moment I'm doing the things as they're hitting me and I'm just struggling, uh, which again, like you said, is ex extremely, uh, uh, you get very much tired and old, it's overwhelming. Uh, and, uh, as, a, as a business person, uh, your personal life is, Zero. Uh, uh, or you, you you don't have any. You know, you, you, I sleep with the business. Uh, it's like I mean, like when I go to bed, it's all I'm always on my head. Uh, so these are the things which are challenging. But uh, uh, and then of course uh, sometimes if I we are applying for funding, it's it's a very tedious work. Funding is. Is extremely, I don't enjoy it, but I have to do it. So these, these are the Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Osman. I'm going to respond to you, Margaret, but in a different format. My problem is when do I start being a refugee? Is it when I get the papers? Is it when I go back to my country? Is it when I get citizenship? At what point do people start labeling, stop labeling me as an asylum seeker now with papers? At what point do people stop labeling me because I still have an accent? Or because I'm still black? So I want to pose the question out there. What are we doing in order for refugees to be like our neighbor, like our friend, like our family. Because until we answer that question, until we say a refugee is just like you and me, we'll always have that divide. There will always be that othering. And the othering isn't answered by legal status. The othering isn't answered by anyone else. It comes from your heart. And that's a very big challenge. And that is where I stand now in trying to generate new narratives from the people who are experiencing it to raise these questions up. And hopefully, hopefully one day, those questions to be answered. Yes, uh, Maureen? Oh, sorry. I give you bad news. You never stop being a refugee. And your children won't stop being refugees. But one day you will get to the point, or they will get to the point, where everybody thinks you're normal. And you suddenly say, actually, I'm a refugee. And that's the closest you're ever going to get to stop being a refugee. <laughs> that's the best answer I've heard in the last <laughs> 15 years. <laughs> So from now on, I think I have to get a balance now, as in, I'm a refugee, you know what I'm saying? That's how I roll. <laughs> uh, any other question before and we stop soon? Thank you, Anand. Uh, I don't have a question because I have rather a comment and it's, it's wonderful to kind of uh, listen to all of you. Uh, I, I when I was kind of reading, uh, reading the title of this panel and leading the conversation and then I was just going through the names and so on. So this, 
this title, the, the other side of hope, it kind of reminded me of a very famous text, The Other Side of Silence. It's a book by someone named Urva Sivudodia. So she basically explores the, um, you know, it's a gender lens to the partition, India Pakistan partition, and the refugees that, you know, traveled uh, both sides of the border and so on. So it's like, you know, the, all the narratives that are kind of silenced and then that go, go missing in official narratives and so on. So it's just goes in to show how important our literature is to kind of give, as you said, a platform or amplify these voices. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Also, just very quickly, a <coughs> reflection on a question about how wonderful this whole panel was. Uh, because, um, um, I mean, I'm not a big fan of platonic idealism of the world of forms, but having heard these, it's actually a world of art that exists. Who would know, walking through Ikea, uh, that a soul would be roaming, filled with uh, artistic manifestations? I just reflected on every single visit to Ikea in plenty of countries and how I was ignoring the fact that I can't decide which chair to buy, not because we can't afford it, but because I don't know how long I want it to be, or they just reflected that I haven't had a landline for 12 years, just because I don't know how, when I, my next move would be. Uh, I think it's, it's not about refugees as a centric essence, it's about creating a more empathetic world that can listen to the dimmer voices, uh, voices such as Maria's uh, from a centuries, uh, from a century, uh, that I know we refugees owe it to her grandmother because if it wasn't for her, people wouldn't have acknowledged the broken system that we already have, this wouldn't have existed uh, at all. It's leading the conversation and enabling people to widen their ears and be more sensitive towards receiving the demo process. So thank you very much. My understanding of integration is 
when we reach a point where you say, Lorraine, your problem is my problem. Your fight is my fight. And I'm saying the same. I will not have integrated. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's too, um, I'm not very, yeah, I think it's two ways, you know. Um, think of how much um, Britain changed because of people who came here, you know. If you go just walk outside and see how many, how it used to be before and, and what people who came from abroad changed, you know. Um, so I think it is, it works both ways. Um, and yeah. I wonder what British expats in Spain would say to this. Um, to me, assimilation and integration are two different things. So, um, integration can be good, it can be very healthy. Um, personally, I want to integrate, I want to have that sense of community wherever I go. Um, but that means exactly what Alex said, there should be a relationship. Um, you know, I will cook my food for you and you will buy me a pint, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But um, assimilation is okay if it's a choice, but it can also be dangerous. Um, like um, earlier we mentioned, we talked about um, Bosnia. Serbia would have considered it assimilation, Bosnia has considered it ethnical cleansing. Um, so where, where do you draw the line with that? <laughs> I, yeah, I totally, 100% agree with you uh, uh, that uh, uh, it should be a choice. And I live all the three phases. There are not two phases. There is a third phase also where there is no integration, no assimilation. There is ghettos. I I have uh, uh, seen all these three where I was living in a, in a in a community, a Pakistani community, and I was just in East London. I was. Just me, I was not even going outside of Eastland, and there are people there uh, spending their lifetime living in. in, a, in a, they don't even. There, there, there are people. Uh, uh, spend, I, I can say uh, the, the Pakistani, Pakistani community. Uh, they are living uh, in this country from like 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 20, 25 years or 30 years. They hardly speak any word of English, uh, but this is their choice. They want to live. Uh, uh, I think integration uh, is where the, the culture grows uh, uh, because in integration you take some uh, from a culture where you, where you live in and then you bring your own culture as well. So I think integration is a very healthy thing to do. Uh, assimilation is what uh, uh, should be alright but of course by choice it shouldn't be like I shouldn't go and I shouldn't tell you how you live your life. I shouldn't come and tell you that you need to do, you need to come uh, go to the pub every, uh, every Sunday. You need to, to like, uh, like this, this, the, 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 this type of living. No, uh, it should be, it shouldn't be forced. But I think integration is where the real, the, the beauty of the culture is, and this is what I think. But again, none of these things should be forced. Everyone has, should have a right the way they want to live their lives. You know, and one more thing is, there shouldn't be dilution of my identity so that you are happy. As long as I can keep my identity, as long as I can keep what I consider is important to my life, then that's fine. I think at the moment, we are, it's only going one way, you know. You learn their language, you learn their ways of life. They don't give a damn about yours. Ah. <laughs> Um, any other questions before we call it? Because uh, remember, Usman hasn't given his uh, five minute sample of a comedy. However, because he's got one hour that he needs to be performing from six to seven. <laughs> so, yes. I actually am not performing today. Salam mentioned me earlier. I want to do. I, I told her, I told her that I want to do like because I told her like weeks ago that uh, uh, we decided that I probably won't perform tonight. Uh, 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 partially because they, she said that it's a 
family friendly kind of environment that I can <laughs> have any, 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 uh, one is I'm not friendly and secondly I don't have family. Uh, but uh, yeah, I probably don't have anything to say if I don't use certain words. So. <laughs> That's why, but, but they're, they're, they are brilliant people who are coming to, to perform. They are, they are way, way, way better than me. Uh, no, that's a problem because <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you are the reason why I'd come today. <laughs> and now that you're performing and you didn't make me taste your coffee, <laughs> that's 2-0. <two> <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll put a one uh, this side of two zeros next time, don't worry. <laughs> Is this the kind of integration or assimilation you're trying to do to me now? <laughs> Alright, um, any last comments, questions? Uh, I'll hand over to, to Anna. Thanks so much, Alan, and thank you for this incredible panel. Will you join me once again? Thank you. At this point, we had planned 10 minutes of interactive feedback from the audience, but it's incredibly hot. We have worked our socks off today, and so I propose an alternative format. Hostile Environment Art for Living, the event that you've attended today, is the start of what we hope will be a much longer running project. You are all here today because we're trying to build a network of people who are engaging from various different directions across the arts, society, community, academia, lived experience, in order to try to work out how to move together. So today, we hope, is the start of something that will run far into the future. We have funding bids planned, we have further network events, we have applications, and we hope that all of you here today will be a part of some of those. We want to hear your ideas, your potential for contributions, your directions, and we were hoping to have time to discuss some of that today, but because we don't have that time, instead I want to direct your attention to the final question on this feedback form, which you all have on your tables, in which there's space for you to write to us about your thoughts, ideas, plans, potentials. So I hope you request that you please make use of that space and add your contact details so that we can remain in touch with you uh, if you want to be a part of future events, which we very much hope you will. Thank you so much for being such an incredible part of these panels. Please go and get yourself a drink, and if you want to join us back in here for the keynote presentation, that will begin online at 4.30. Um, so thank you all for your attention, and we'll see you back shortly. Thank So we are honoured to be hosting an online keynote lecture from Professor Yen Le Espiritu, who is Distinguished Professor of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, San Diego. An award-winning author, she has published extensively on uh, Asian American panethnicity, gender and migration, and US colonialism and wars in Asia. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, her recent book, Body Counts, The Vietnam War and Militarised Refugees, charts an interdisciplinary field of critical refugee studies which reconceptualises the refugee not as an object of rescue, but as a site of social and political critiques. 
Uh, Espiritu has served several terms of chair of the Ethnic Studies Department and also as its Director of Undergraduate Studies and Director of Graduate Studies. She is a founding member of the Critical Refugee Studies Collective, whose aim is to integrate scholarly, policy, artistic, legal, diplomatic and international relations interests with refugees' everyday experiences. With this collective, she has published the field-defining work, Departures and Introduction to Critical Refugee Studies. Espiritu is the recipient of several UCSD teaching awards, the Eleanor Roosevelt College's Outstanding Faculty Award, the Academic Senate Distinguished Teaching Award, and actually this list goes on too long for me to read them all out, so I'm going to leave you to imagine them. Today, she has very kindly agreed to speak to us about two distinctive concepts within critical refugee studies, which I think you're going to find very interesting, whatever perspective you are working um, from. Uh, because these perspectives have perhaps not yet made it into critical discussion of refugee experience within the UK. These are the concepts of livability and ingratitude as alternative sites of resistance, knowledge production and epistemic disobedience. Today then she will speak to us on the topic of livability and ungratefulness, a refugee critique of the law and humanitarianism. We're so grateful to have this opportunity to connect with Professor Espiritu in spite of geographical distance. And uh, I do hope that you'll join me in discussion of her paper after her 45 minute presentation. Thank you, Professor Espiritu. Okay, should I begin? Oh yeah, I need mean, like, a co-host. We're good? Yes, My face is very big on the screen. Um, so I'm going to be um, talking from these two books. Um, the first one is Body Counts, The Vietnam War and Militarized Refugees, which I published um, in, like, in 2014, I believe, um, which I coined the term Critical Refugee Studies. Um, the second book is Departures as an Introduction to Critical Refugee Studies, which um, the Critical Refugee Studies Collective had just published um, a few months ago. And so I want to begin with just some numbers. 
Um, we live uh, in a time when migration has become an increasingly important point of people's strategy for gaining access to much needed life resources or even to life. And when, but also when um, capital and military have more freedom than migrants displaced from these processes to cross borders. So you can see today, uh, one out of every 30 humans in the world live in a place other than the one they were born in. According to the United Nations Human Rights, Human High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR, at the end of 2022, the number of forcibly displaced people has reached 108 million people worldwide as a result of war, persecution, conflict, violence and human rights violation, and increasingly of climate change. So in essence, what, you know, what do these numbers mean? So in essence, every two seconds, one person is forcibly displaced somewhere in the world. As the Pulitzer Prize winning author Dave Tenwing reminds us, if refugees want to form their own country, it would be the world's 24th largest country, bigger than South Africa, bigger than Spain, Iraq, or Canada. And if you look at the, um, the figure that you will see that only 35.3 million are recognized as refugees, and 62.5 million are internally displaced people who are not recognized as refugees at all. And then 5.4 5 million are asylum seekers who are trying to get um, refugee status. So I want to now discuss two approaches to the refugee um, situation from both, um, one is the, the first one I want to uh, discuss is the refugee crisis. So, so much of the public, the scholarship and public discourse on refugees, it's framed from the perspective, logic, and needs of the nation state and of humanitarian organizations, which relegate refugees' interests, desires, and needs as secondary considerations. So the first approach is what I call the refugee crisis approach. So as we know, most of the discourse on refugees adopts a state-driven approach that views refugees through the security lens as a crisis and a source of threat. And you can see, you know, with the images that the uh, emergency crisis, national security, migrant, migrant crisis at the Mexico border, and so on. Um, so the response from the critical refugee studies approach is that very simply, migrations do not just happen, they are produced. Then the language of refugee crisis and migrant invasion and so on depicts refugees and asylum seekers as the cause of an imagined crisis at the border. Migrant and refugee crisis, however, are actually the outcome of the actual crisis of capitalist globalization, conquest, militarism, and increasingly climate change, which of course is linked to one of the other um, structures of power. So all too often we speak of refugees as if they simply showed up from out of nowhere, like in the US. Politicians would say, why us? Why do they come here? Why are they um, trying to cross our borders? But global migration, as we know, is not a random process. For many displaced peoples in the world, migration patterns were forced by colonialism and or militarism. So the, so the question of why they are here is, of course, can be responded by the adage, we are here because you were there. On the right uh, image, I uh, have a quote from Suketu Mehta, um, who made the argument is, um, quote, um, today, a quarter of a billion people are migrants. They are moving because the rich countries have stolen the fruit of uh, the broken news. Unquote. Um, and on the, the screen, the, you can see um, it said, before you ask migrants to respect our borders, ask yourself, has the West ever respected anyone's borders? 
So again, thinking about the response to the refugee crisis, um, narrative is to say migrations do not just happen, they are produced. Um, the second approach to refugee um, migration is through the humanitarian lens, um, which represent refugee as objects of rescue. And so on the, the slide, um, the first image on the left, um, I don't know if you can recognize this celebrity, but this is a photo of actress Angelina Jolie, who served as a goodwill ambassador from um, 2001 to 2012, and then a special envoy from 2012 to 2022 for the UNHCR. So this is an example of um, what I call the um, celebrity humanitarian. Um, so the, our critique of this, the humanitarian perspective of the humanitarian lens is first um, the humanitarianism originates from and reproduces unequal power relationships. Second, when we talk about assistance or charity as a gift to the refugees, in which moral responsibility is based on pity and compassion rather than the demand for justice. So the idea is that um, when we say let's help refugees, let's have compassion for them, um, we are, that is a moral responsibility. We are focusing on pity and compassion rather than the demand for justice. Um, the humanitarian lens also focuses on the language of suffering rather than the language of inequality. The humanitarian lens also focuses on trauma rather than name the violence that causes trauma. So in such narratives, refugees become both invisible and hyper-visible but almost always infantilized, as you can see in the bottom photo, um, and exoticized, pity, and um, dehumanized. So what is the critical refugees approach to refugees? Instead of seeing the refugee as a problem for the state, or as an object of rescue, um, critical refugee studies conceptualizes the refugee as one, a site of social and political critique, that is, a source of knowledge that reveals the interlinked histories of colonization, war, global capitalism, and displacement. Second, a refugee is a um, site of theory making and knowledge production. So refugee studies for us is the mode of analysis and a paradigm and refugees constitute knowledge producers. And I want to say parenthetically that I was trained in sociology and for a long time I didn't um, study um, refugees even though I'm a refugee originally from Vietnam. And the reason being was that the literature in the social sciences on refugees um, Look, uh, produce refugees as a problem to be solved. And um, so for me, um, you know, as a refugee, that was not how I wanted to be represented. And so to be able to um, conceptualize refugees as knowledge producers and as a and refugee studies as a paradigm um, has enabled me to think much more critically as well as personally about um, being a refugee and thinking about the refugee condition more generally. So critical refugee studies approaches the question of refugee from the knowledge point of the forcibly displaced from the lived, embodied experiences, memories, and post-memories of refugees and their children who craft their lives in the ever-unfolding afterlife of multiple forms of disaster. As Ocean Boon, um, who is a, um, a Vietnamese-American novelist says, quote, no one accidentally survives, unquote. And this quote for me really evokes all of the, the creativity, the ingenuity, the 
the patience, the imagination that refugees have had to um, um, if, you know, uh, uh, conjure up in order to survive. And so, um, the, so we can learn so much uh, from thinking about um, refugee experiences and from theorizing uh, from, the, from the place of refugee hide. Um, so, the, so next I want to um, offer two concepts, two refugee-generated concepts, that is, concepts that emerge from refugee lives. The first one is refugee livability. Migrants, um, um, so refugee livability is offered here instead of thinking about the concept of fear, uh, which is often linked to the ways in which we conceptualize refugee. Um, so refugees are subject to the double burden of fear. The first burden is that they are expected to demonstrate fear to gain asylum, right, to, to gain refugee status. And um, this is um, a, a condition that, um, that emerged out of the 1951 Refugee Convention in which um, refugees um, are defined as people who can demonstrate, quote, a well-rounded fear of persecution, unquote. So in order to gain refugee status or asylum, refugees have to um, convey through words, through um, it, um, uh, petition and so on, that they have been, um, they have experienced a well-rounded fear of persecution, which as you can imagine, it's asking them to relive over and over again the trauma that they have endured. Um, but it also doesn't allow us to take a long look at the production of refugee, for example, um, by being, by asking us to demonstrate well rounded fear of persecution, refugees have to uh, conjure up the immediate um, danger to their lives. So this, so this. Um, Petition can be linked back to, you know, processes of colonialism or militarism because they all have to demonstrate an immediate um, kind of fear. Um, so, in addition to being asked to demonstrate fear to gain entry or asylum, they are also regarded as those who are to be feared by the receiving um, state, and so they are sub subject to the double burden of fear. So in um, response to, to this double burden of fear, we offer the concept of refugee livability. And the artwork here is from the Syrian Refugee Art Initiative. I just really love the colors and um, it conveys this idea of livability. Departing from the convention definition, the 1951 convention definition of refugee that is based on fear, Critical Refugee Studies offers the concept of refugee livability to name the mundane, creative, and fearless possibilities of the thing in, ref uh, in refugee claims of the right to return, to stay, and to move audaciously, that is to be sent everywhere, to think about mobility justice. It's an insistence on a better life that is not centered on fear, but on humanity, dignity, and futurity. And <clears throat> it is to engage the truth of the possible, not the actual. While we acknowledge the power of law to constitute reality, we think it's very important for us to look to refugees' meaning making practices, that is, through storytelling, lying even, refusal to disappear, to craft the understanding of livability where life is, by, is dignified. So as an example of refugee livability, I think about, and you may be familiar with this, the situation at the U.S.-Mexico border. I live in San Diego, so this is um, very close to, to, my, um, to my home. And um, as you may be aware of, the Central American migrants who have gone, who have literally walked to the U.S.-Mexico border from various countries in Central America and um, demanding that they, that they gain entry, that they, get, that they are given asylum to the U.S. And there's something so powerful about asylum seekers uh, uh, 
you know, walking um, in, on a mat, and um, not, not, not in um, secretive ways, but you know, in, in public, and in demanding that, that, that they um, um, give in asylum so that they can live a livable life. So by continuing to show up even under very um, harsh conditions, by them even, this um, asylum seeker point out that the law is not a totalizing force in refugee lives. They point out the law's limitations, they engage, critique, and evade the law every day. Um, and in so doing, they assert and exercise agency that the law cannot fully account for and manage refugee. Um, the, the crisis, um, and you know, we really have thrown U.S. immigration um, system into crisis. Um, with politicians saying, we don't know what to do. They keep coming, and I think that is the point. Refugees demonstrate both the capacity and power, um, their own capacity and power, but the, the power of the state and the limits of state power and flawed, and the flawed shortcomings with existing refugee laws. And what, so we argue that what they are doing is that they insist on livability that is a better life that is centered on humanity, dignity, and futurity. And the, so this concept of refugee livability emerges from the, uh, from the practices that refugees engage in. Um, and in so doing, they um, allow us to have a glimpse of a, a future that, uh, that is very possible. Um, where refugee livability is how we center this discussion and how we imagine um, refugee um, laws. The second uh, concept that is also refugee centered is this idea of refugee refusal or ingratitude. So for refugees, exhibiting gratitude is often the unspoken condition to acceptance hospitality, and friendship, which of course remove their agency and dignity. So as a refugee myself, I can share so many examples of people um, coming up uh, in conversation, um, expecting uh, me to somehow weep into my, my you know, uh, conversation with them that I'm really grateful to be um, a refugee in the United States, never mind the Vietnam War, um, the Vietnam War that produced refugees from Vietnam. And it is, um, and the, this expectation is so, even this lane is so strong that if you ever um, go against it, the, the reaction is immediate. And I have been told at times when I have critiqued um, different aspects of the US. Um, with U.S. policies, I was told immediately that if you don't like it here, go back to where you come from. Um, so the, the expectation that refugee exhibit gratitude is, is strong and, um, uh, and, and is really a condition to acceptance um, and hospitality. So on the right, on the image, this is um, the book cover, um, and Dina Nayeli is an Iranian um, American, who wrote this really wonderful book on, um, it's the title of it, The Ungrateful Refugee, and um, it, it sparked um, our work here on refugee refusal and ingratitude. So, um, Dina Nayare um, uh, said, quote, that refugees should not have to, quote, spend the rest of our days in grateful ecstasy, atoning for our need. And I think it's such a, a a beautiful way of thinking about um, yeah, what refugee should not have to do in order to live, right? in order to have a capability. So most often, due to the power differentials though, it's really difficult for refugee to clearly state that we don't have to be grateful for you. So instead, I think um, we argue that refugees' gratitude often take the place of, of being very strategic and performative. The refugees who have minimal power and few resources are very self-aware as they play out the relationships and affects 
require them to survive and even to thrive. Um, so the idea that even when refugees express gratitude, and, and oftentimes in very public ways, um, they, they do so um, in, a, in a very um, strategic and performative manner. So even when basic humanitarian language, this calculated performances of gratitude constitute an rooted in lived experience struggles that disrupts, however temporarily, the mythologies underlying humanitarian claims of refugee admission and resettlement. So as such, refugees, and this is the, the term that we have coined, the strategic performativity is more than a defensive tactic that ensures survival and prosperity in a sponsorship-based economy. It is, as we argue, also a calculated action that exposes the uneven distribution of global resources as refugees maneuver, maneuver always to gain entry, shelter, and provisions as they insist on their right to more, that is, to livability. Um, so what, what um, we mean here is that in looking at, in examining refugee strategic performativity of gratitude, we, th this action, this refugee action simultaneously allows us to see the uneven distribution of global resources. So it, it exposes it, it makes it visible um, because the, it is the uneven distribution of global resources that necessitates this performativity of, of being uh, grateful. So conceptualized in refugees' performance of gratitude and def deference as strategic underscores the importance of grounding theory on refugees in concrete refugee struggles, um, tending always to the specific histories and contexts that shape their claims. So the, the last um, 10 minutes or so of my talk, I want to focus on art as a site of knowledge production. Um, so first of all, to make some preliminary um, comments and then I'll um, discuss this particular artwork. Um, so, so this is an introduction to this. So critical refugee studies um, makes an intervention into what, what counts as knowledge. Um, so it matters who gets to shape the narrative about displacement and refuge. So we pay attention to art as a site of knowledge production because art as well as social justice activism and organizing are, are more hospitable to current and recent refugees than academia. Refugees from across the world are working as artists, writers, activists, and organizers, and maybe so many of you in the room, I understand that like, from, um, from this category. So art and, activi and activism or activism does not require the mature conditions um, in the same way. Culture, capital, and language skills that are often necessary for the pursuit of scholarly knowledge. As a result, the fields of activity are often more open, vibrant, and dynamic, and have much to teach us about the contemporary struggles of refugees, about solidarity across borders and boundaries, about visions of an unsuffocated world and means of creating it. So critical refugee studies is being attentive to the ways in which refugees enact their hopes, beliefs, and politics in art and literature, even when their lives are edged with precarity. So we looked at the study of the arts, literature, film and media, and language to center refugee practices of storytelling and their acts of creative expression. So we asked, what are the desires and not only the needs of the forcibly displaced as they create, improvise, fluid and alternative homemaking, healing, and strategies on the run. Critical refugee studies adheres to a feminist refugee epistemology, which um, my colleague and I have published an article on this concept if you're interested. 
Um, so feminist refugee epistemology takes seriously the intersection between private greed and public violence, and the hidden and overt injuries was also joy that play out in the domain of the internet. So I'm, um, the rest of the time I'm going to share with you my analysis of this um, art installation. And I um, would love to hear um, if, you, if you feel inclined um, your own interpretation of this really beautiful um, piece of work. And this is in, uh, entitled by it, and I should have put the artist's name. It's to my head, a Japanese American artist um, in uh, Orange County in Southern California. So this art installation featured at the uh, Vietnamese Focus Generations of Stories exhibit in Orange County, California from September 2015 to February 2016. It's a haunting tribute memorial to the Vietnamese children who went missing during the escape from Vietnam, mainly at sea in the 1980s. Um, so quiet, in the name of the installation, contributes to feminist refugee epistemology, we argue, because it asks us to look for history outside the public realm of state-sanctioned commemorative discourses and memorials and to engage other senses, such as feelings and emotions, in order to search for the quiet ways that subjugated refugee stories get retold. So how a refugee story get retold? How, how are they retold in the um, art um, installation? So the, um, the information for this installation was a box of letters that the artist discovered at the Southeast Asian Archive Center at University of California in Irvine. Um, so these are letters that family members had written to an international agency pleading for assistance in finding their children who went missing during their escape from Vietnam. And you know, it's important to know that this missing children comprise just a fraction of the hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese who disappeared during and immediately after the war and whose lives were never given a definite ending. So I see this art piece as a memorial tribute to this missing children. So it's an installation and what you see um, at the, the night, um, the strips, it's a um, 12 foot and the, this white strip that called Khang Tan, uh, which is a Vietnamese word uh, for the um, white cotton, cotton sash that the Vietnamese families wear up on their heads during the funeral. So you would take this piece of white cloth and you will you know, tie it around your head um, to, to signify that you are members of the family members of the deceased. And so in this installation, um, she has used this um, uh, kantan and hanged hang them from the ceiling. The prison dead of the missing play a prominent role in this piece. So painted onto the end of each white sash in black is the face of a disappeared Vietnamese child. Her, the artist's refusal to allow this missing bodies to simply disappear, that is to be reduced to non-bodies and unpeople, constitutes a feminist, feminist reconfiguration of time, we argue, as it conceptualizes this place in the needs of those who tempor temporarily keep on existing. Against the masculinist hyper-visibility of American representations of the fall of Saigon, in April 1975, as the world's unambiguous conclusion, the artist's effort to respect and honor the Vietnamese dead offers not only an alternative but a contested temporality, one that proclaims, in Katharina Boone's words, quote, that those swept into the Olivian were once here, were important, and above all were human, with personal dreams hopes and disappointment, unquote. And I, get, I would argue that the use of the Vietnamese funerary items, the white kantan, centered the refugees' own grieving practices 
symbolically bestowing on each missing child the Vietnamese dead ritual that they had missed. Um, so yeah, we see this as a um, as a communal ritual, um, evoking ghosts ho hovering just overhead. The exhibit bestows on each child the Vietnamese dead ritual that they had missed. Exhibit, but and then view um, viewers um, who go through the public viewing. We argue are in fact participating in a communal visual, um, which honor um, the, the, the refugee children. Using a typewriter, she then typed out the excerpt from the letters from their family, pleading for assistance on the other side of the of the set. Um, and you know, um, um, Pat is a second generation Vietnamese. American artist, so she herself was not part of the refugee exodus, and she shared with me that it was such a moving and um, disappointing, uh, as well as quite a practice to do this because she was, in a sense, um, sitting with the boxes of memories, and um, and so as she was typing the the letters, um, the words of the letters onto the satchel, she. So she couldn't help also adding her own letter to the children um, because she wanted to acknowledge um, their ongoing presence. Finally, hanging the sashes from the ceiling, making them too high to read, um, the artist invites the viewer to imagine rather than read the letter's content, thereby bypassing the risk of further exposing the family's pr private grief the pure strangers, however well-meaning. So it's really moving away from the discourse of, of pity or even humanitarian assistance um, by giving the um, refugee, uh, the refugee parents and children the dignity as well as the, um, the privacy that all of us deserve. So the argument is that refugee um, art work produces an important alternative archive of critical remembering to preserve refugee stories in the face of unknown erasure and threat. So to conclude, and I think I'm exactly on time, to conclude, departing from the asymmetrical representational apparatus that renders refugees both hyper-visible and invisible, therefore erasing their humanity, heterogeneity, and agency, Critical refugee studies conceptualizes refugee lived experience as a site of theory making and knowledge production, including, of course, um, knowledge production, emotion, compromise. The grasp refugee agency and epistemology, critical refugee studies offers a refugee critique of the law and humanitarianism by moving resolutely toward formations of refugee livability and ungratefulness. There's two concepts, refugee livability and ungratefulness, serve as points of access to distinctly discernible refugee agency and epistemology that break with the historically appointed role of refugees as seen entirely through the lens of crisis, precarity, and gratitude. So I think I'm exactly at 9 15 my time. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, to uh, keep with the time that you are working with. Uh, Yen, are you able to hear me if I speak into the mic? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much for uh, this incredibly stimulating and important presentation. I'm going to open up to questions from the audience, and if it's hard for you to hear in the room, I'll walk up and relay them to the computer. Please. As you move away from the computer, it does get muffled. Sure. I will take questions from the room, and I will return to you on the computer to relay them afterwards. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we'll do our best. <laughs> okay. Um, but if I may, I'd like to begin with an initial question. And this is how we make ingratitude 
safe? How we make it something which is accessible? Because it strikes me that narratives of gratitude are so often performed out of a sense of precarity and a sense of necessity. So my first question is, and there are so many of us who believe that ingratitude is absolutely vital um, in a hostile environment, uh, but how do we make it so that we do not forfeit rights and so that we don't open ourselves up to harm by performing ingratitude? Yes, um, th that is such a good question, and I, you know, welcome your own um, uh, practices in, in thinking through this. And I think that this is why we um, think about gratitude as a, not as whether or not you perform it, or, you know, whether you perform it or not, but as a range. And um, so a lot of our work is to think about how gratitude, even when expressed, how could they be strategic? Um, and, um, and performative. And so the, the performativity um, I, um, allows refugee the agency to control how, how, how they want to express that, that, that gratitude. Um, and so, yeah, so I think the, the, the work for, for us is to recognize that gratitude doesn't necessarily mean that the refugee is grateful to the state that has produce the displacement. Um, but I also want to say that it is important to acknowledge that refugees are grateful um, for their life. Like I, I think about if you are alive, if you have gone through all of this um, difficult situation to get somewhere, you are grateful. But the gratitude isn't reserved for the state necessarily, even if that is how um, people um, have to express it, but the gratitude uh, is genuine and it really belongs to all of the people in the community, belongs to the family and, and the, the, um, the, the kin, but the, the kin, uh, whether or not they are blood related, who has accompanied them on their journey. But yeah, so thinking about um, performativity is important. Thank you. I'm going to open the questions up to the room now, please. And, uh, relate them to yeah, if she's had any yeah. thoughts, responses, questions. Please. Oh, okay. uh, so my question is about livability, I think. I mean, I can see that livability could be something quite consensual, but it could also be something quite radical. Uh, so I just wondered which kind of version of livability you might lean towards and what might it imply if you, if you adopt a radical version of livability. who continues to 
come to the U.S. And, and I do think that they engage in radical um, unlivability um, because they refuse. So for us, they refuse that their lives are not, um, uh, you know, that, that their lives are not what the, um, that, that, they, that, they, that they do not have the um, ability to engage in the, the kind of livability that other people uh, can. And there's something to me so powerful about them you know, moving en masse without apology in a very public way to the U.S. border. And in, in many ways, I, I see it as it's also radical in that they are calling attention in many ways to the unlivable conditions in, in their home, which allow us then to open up the question as to well, what produced these unlivable conditions, which might allow us to go back to thinking, historically to think about U.S. Um, interventions in Central America. So radical livability expose, has to expose the conditions that produce displacement, as well as um, a radical way of imagining um, yeah, space um, and, and mobility. Thank you. Further questions, thoughts, comments? Please, Tom. Um, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I don't think you can hear me, but if you could pass that on as well, that would be great. Um, I'm really interested in the aspect of the futurity of livability, uh, which was in one of the slides there. And I'm, I'm thinking about how futurity in critical refugee studies interfaces with ideas of futurity in black studies and indigenous studies, both of which contain a lot of good thinking on ideas of futures and futurities, sort of in the plural. Um, so what are the possibilities of holding those things together? Let's see. Um, or, or you know, divides um, indigenous nations. 
So all of this, uh, yeah, all of this ways of thinking with it really being allow us to engage in, in a in much um, more robust and you know definition and understanding and, and wish for opportunity. Thank you, thank you. I think we have time for one last question if anyone has one. Please, Safa. Thank you very much. I have five, but I'm big one. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. No, no, I'll just ask one question. I think to start the comedy gig earlier. I really have loads of questions, but uh, just one about yeah, utilizing. So such knowledge produced and driven by the lived experience uh, of refugees and asylum seekers through art is amazing. We've had such an incredible day. However, this is very extremely hard to utilize within public sector organizations and humanitarian aid organizations, which follows the second like, bit of, of your uh, Lecture, then what, where do you suggest we start for practical uh, utilization of this knowledge and uh, so that it informs structures, decisions, cultures within already existing, already flawed humanitarian system? Yeah, of course, that's the million dollar question. Um, and I wish I were that in person to engage all of you on this question, which I know for all of you who are in the room, um, who are um, similarly concerned about the refugee conditions and doing so much work on your own to, um, yeah, to uh, enact right, the, the, the things that we desire. <clears throat> I think that's, that's a, uh, an important and difficult question. Um, the first thing I would say is that it is really important to shift narratives. And so, um, it, you know, before we have, uh, because humanitarian organizations or the state do not function um, outside of narrative. Right? So the, the ways in which they imagine um, who refugees are, the ways in which they speak about them, inform um, the practices. And so, um, so that signifies that are attached to refugee often hopelessness, you know, victim, and, and um, uh, enemy, you know, and so on. And so, one thing that critical refugee studies try to do, and, and it seems to me your own work, is to disrupt, you know, to, to disrupt that, uh, that connection and to produce, offer new vocabulary so that when, you, when we talk about refugee, there are new signifiers, right? So the refugee now can signify uh, livability and maybe signify um, um, you know, futurity, resistance, um, and, and, and honor, and, and um, you know, the multiple other vocabularies that we can offer. So I think um, I, I don't want to make the distinction between the things that we do and then what humanitarian, humanitarian organization and, and state uh, institution do because they do draw on existing vocabulary and so it's, it's super critical for all of us to continue to offer new vocabulary or to imbue um, uh, ongoing <coughs> existing vocabulary with new meaning. For example, I think about the term border crosses um, and to say yes, yeah, we can use the term border crosses, but if we can think about the US as the first border crosser, right? Or um, or the UK, or you know, England as the, the border crosser. So, so it, that work is, is really critical because it's, it does attach to action and it does produce action. Um, and the second thing, more pragmatically, is that um, we have written to the UNHCR, we have one of our colleagues um, it's, that works with the UNHCR, and if you see at the end of our work departures, we have, um, because um, we, we understand the importance of letters, letters, so that as a, as a refugee, you always have to write letters to whomever in order to plead for the case. 
And so and at the end of our book, we have a letter to the UNHCR in which we outline, you know, uh, some of the of what I have shared with you today. And we have um, uh, the, the UNHCR had to call every year for people to submit um, letters to them or, or you know, suggestions uh, and to be included in uh, some production that they have in, uh, at the end of the process. So we have done that and, um, and we will continue to, to engage on them. We have, we, you know, we give talks to humanitarian organizations. Um, we um, hope to have a, um, like a uh, two-day symposium working with journalists um, to to move away from what we call not what we call but what many people have called immigration point. You know how to move away from this crisis language and then to offer um, other ways of representing refugees to journalists. We have we have um, begun one, uh, a refugee teaching institute, which in which we work with teachers. Uh, so refugee, I mean teachers to to bring refugee studies into the classroom in ways that will uh, foreground livability. Um, maybe not in gratitude, you know, for, for schools that might be a little bit hard, but livability and um, uh, thinking about how, how we will create curriculum that center refugees. But those are the, the, the public um, action, um, the, the ways in which we have engaged the public. Um, looking, looking at teachers, humanitarian organizations, um, as well as, um, uh, the, yeah, we, we really do want to work with journalists because they are the key to the dissemination of information and images on refugees. I hope that answered your question. But yeah, if you have your own practice, I would love to, to learn from you as well. Amazing. That's a really great place um, to conclude, actually, because it's inspiring to hear all of the work that you're doing, um, which provides us with points of inspiration for many of the paradigms that we're seeking to build within the UK. And I should say that within the room, there are people working within the fields of documentary journalism, um, mm -hmm. seeking to construct different kinds of narratives in that way. So uh, thank you very much indeed, Professor Aspirity, for joining us, for sharing your insights, um, for this really rich and thought-provoking talk. Um, I know that it's right at the start of the day where you are in San Diego. It's right at the end of a seven and a half hour stint in an extremely hot room here for us. <laughs> so I'm going to let these good people go and get a drink before we go to the comedy gig for Direction Hope. No Direction Hope now. Um, but please, will you join me once again in thanking Professor <laughs> Refugeestudy.com. So if you want to um, take a look, we have a lot of refugee guides on our website that you want to join. Um, have a great evening. Thank you so much.